everything is hunky and dory. Everything is ship mm. and shape. Everything is tip and top. Okay. I'm thinking. That's how I feel anyway. As long as you feel good about it. Then I, I do. Will, where you lead, I will follow. I do. On the, on the old pencast. The old pencast. That's right. 126 of them. Yes, indeed. Sound like the beaver from, or the groundhog from Winnie the Pooh? Maybe. What's his name? I don't know. He's got a... a really, Knowing Winnie the Pooh is probably... Really whistly, his, his name is essay. probably just Groundhog. Yeah, I don't know. Because like some I of them are just like... Name. What is his name? I don't know. We're not like technically... He's just got like yeah. rabbit and owl, but then Eeyore gets his mm, own name. Why don't they call him Pooh. Donkey? Yeah, Piglet. Like that's, Yeah, it's like, what, what's so special about Eeyore and Pooh? They get names. Winnie the Pooh. What is his name? Groundhog? I don't know. I don't even remember a groundhog. Ground? I think he's a groundhog. Yeah, him. What's his name? He's got like big buck teeth and... What is his name? What is a groundhog's name on Winnie the Pooh? Gopher. gopher. He's right. a gopher. Okay. So Pooh and Eeyore are the only gopher. people that get only in, in, uh, animals that get names. Tigger. Oh, okay. Well, kind of, I guess. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's. But still, yeah. I wonder. That's yeah, pretty weird. lazy. Pretty lazy writing. I, I, I think. guess so. <clears throat> Have you seen Winnie the Pooh: Blood and Honey? No, but I've heard it was. I haven't either. Heinous. I'm not going to waste my time with that. I've got movies yeah. I actually want to watch. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, you ready to do it? Yes. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 126 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, I'm back, replacing Father Brian, but hope you all enjoyed your time with him seems like you did based on the comments uh i'm here because i was out of town and i will talk about that more well, good i was gonna ask you about that and i'm not sick but my voice is a little lower than usual which i like you talked a I lot i'm sure i was talking non-stop i was at yeah. a work conference so lots and lots and lots of talking how many times did you explain what a fountain pen was roughly i don't have to explain it all that much anymore all right this is a group that knows me pretty well oh that's fantastic i still have to explain it plenty though yeah pretty much everywhere i go it's like a just a part of the thing, but it's nice when I travel because I can have a pen on me. And people be like, found pen. I'm like, yeah, it's a thing. Okay, here, let me just show you. Yeah. And then they get it. Um, as opposed to people who sell like motorcycle tires or, you know, whatever. They can't just whip one of those out. It's a little tougher. Yeah. But most people know what motorcycles are, so maybe they don't have to. Anyway, uh, today we're going to be talking about how many pens that we carry while traveling. How timely is that? Uh, how we know when we have too many pens if that's even possible. I'm not sure what I have to share on that front. Um, what are the criteria for a Goulet exclusive product? A little inside baseball there. Some of y'all might enjoy that. Uh, what do we recommend for Disney inspired pens? So kind of going off of, what have we done before? We did the- We've done Office. What did we do, the Office? And, and you did some done, mar Marvel stuff? or Yeah, did we some, did. We've done Marvel, did we've done Avengers, I, we've yeah. done Office, and we, then we've done Mario, and then we've done- Did we? I think so. I don't feel like I participated in all Mario. these. I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember doing Mario. We've but done a few. I don't remember doing most of them. I don't remember most of what we talked about in all the previous pincasts. So, yeah, well, that's why we record them <laughs> so that y'all can see it. Um, we're also apparently going to be sharing my Apple Cinnamon Cheerio story that you talked about a couple weeks Someone ago. Ass. Yep. And we'll do a spotlight on the Lamy Lux or, or LX. Or LX. However you want to pronounce it. Lix, Lux, Lux, Lux. Let's not do Lux. Lix. Licks. Licks sounds weird. I don't know why it would be Licks. Lux. Lux, LX, whatever it is. Um, yeah, and then we'll have obviously plenty of nonsense to talk about. Uh, and we'll kick off the episode with some feedback. All right. Our first feedback nugget mm -hmm. is from CM Brez. I normally listen to the podcast, a uh, pencast on Spotify, but mm -hmm. there wasn't a new one there yesterday. So Whoops. I was glad to see that you did, in fact, release one yesterday. Yay! That was my fault. I'm glad that you did find the YouTube video, which is where this comment was coming from, but I forgot to click the little button that changes it from private to public mm. on Friday. So, so I you, went ahead and... You published it. You just yeah. published it privately. Yes. So, yeah. It, it was there, but not. So mm. my friendly podcast listeners out there, uh, I apologize here now in audio form as you take this one in, hopefully on time. 
Secretly, Drew was just testing to see if y'all actually listen. So he didn't publish it to see how much of a uh, an upswell that of was it. demand there was for it. That was it. And there were really. at least two. There were at least two people that mentioned it to me, so I consider hey, that you know, audi- loyal audience. There we two. go. We'll I, take it. I was just telling you, I want to help at least two people. So there you go. Yeah. If it's just one of you, sorry. Go elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then a couple of you also mentioned that when we showed Brian K's uh, Frank and Penn abomination mm. later in the show, where he had an entire ink sample attached to the back of a Safari grip section, we neglected to cut away to the, you know, my cell phone footage. So sorry about that. Um, I'll put in a picture or something here um, so you can see a little bit closer up. But uh, yeah, it's it's... It's offensive anyway. I don't know why you would want to see it. <laughs> and um, Jack Sanders says, I was unaware of scented inks entirely, and mm. now I need noir inspiration, which is one of the scented inks we reviewed. Reading off the scent description, and I go, oh, I'd wear that. And hey, given my track record, I probably will be wearing it. Meaning spilling it, which I thought was pretty yes. clever. That yes. one was the most pleasant one. That one mm-hmm. actually smelled like a cologne. It was a very nice, yeah, pleasant, full-bodied smell. Yeah, you can just take some and dab a little like underneath your there jawline we go. there. Yeah, and it's like a yeah. bronzer as well. <laughs> All right. Breezy Veezy says, I cannot believe the green weenie came up in conversation on here. I had one growing up in Pittsburgh, possibly, obviously, but I think we tossed it ages ago because it was already like 20 years old by the time I got my grubby baby hands on it in the early 90s. Dang, now I wish I still had it. Do you know what the green weenie is, Brian? I have no idea. I haven't seen, to be fair, I haven't seen the episode yet. I wasn't planning on doing a fun fact, Uh but someone mentioned a Birmingham ink called green weenie. Yeah, okay. And I had to look it up and Mm -hmm. it brought me into a fun fact, which, Mm. you know, my grandfather had called his boat the green weenie and I never knew why. Okay. The green weenie is essentially like a pickle rattle a green hot dog rattle that was shaken at pittsburgh pirates fan or pittsburgh pirates to bless them or the enemies of the pittsburgh pirates to vex them oh it was like a talisman of juju interesting good or evil interesting. yeah okay and it was like it was a green hot dog rattle <laughs> okay <laughs> it's a green weenie that is interesting <laughs> yeah I thought that was a great fun fact that is definitely a random fact yes yeah. very cool um well, I got some I got some feedback as well. Um, this is from Knit Sista. Loved the show. I always enjoy Brian K's display of the Frankenpens he creates. I am in awe of all of you and enjoy listening to all of you and your downtime activities. I sometimes laugh out loud on the New York City subway. As a wife, I would love to have Rachel and Shannon come on sometime to talk about their reactions to your antics. Keep the pencast coming. The longer, the better. I don't know if Rachel would have any reactions to our antics on the pencast because I think she's maybe watched 15 minutes collectively of a pencast. Yeah, sometimes Shannon wa- <laughs> watches the uh, What's Happening session to kind of just kind of view my opinion okay. on our previous weekend. <laughs> um, right. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, they would have opinions for sure. They would definitely. Have they don't have any opinions, opinions about what we talk about here because they get enough of us all yeah. the time. So they're not like watching this to see what's going on. Yeah, they're there real time. As you could, we're you, could it. you could, you could ask them. You could submit questions about Disney Dreamlight Valley, and they would have plenty to talk. They about. They would both have things to talk about there. Yeah. Yes, Animal Crossing, yeah. New Horizons, and all kinds of stuff. But, Rachel's got uh, a new game, uh, Fay Farm, I think it's called. It seems like all of them mashed together with slightly different characters and slightly less awkward noises coming from the characters because definitely with with Animal Crossing, or oh. no, with uh, Legend of Zelda, um, the Breath of the Wild. Both, both, of, both, them. both of them. Yeah, whenever you talk to somebody, they some just the, go like, uh? Some, yeah. Or some like, of the noises, uh? particularly from some of the like fairies and things like that, I'm just kind of like, it sounds... Sounds like not really a children's game sounds there. If you're just like hearing it in the background, like I often am. But anyway, um, yeah, we've talked about it. I don't know if it'll ever happen. We have. We've talked about Rachel and Shannon. We've talked about Archer and Ellie. And oh, Ellie wants to be on. She yeah. asks me about it constantly. We definitely would like to. So we'll it's make that just like somehow. Yeah. Of all, it just it just takes work. It is. Yeah. We'll 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 see what we can do. Yeah. We'll see what we can do. Um, okay. 
but we'll definitely keep going long. Um, okay, this is from, Pu- oh my gosh, how do you pronounce this? Puto Chuchinta. <laughs> Forgive me if I mispronounce that. Uh, Brian actually does sound like Brian sometimes. I was playing this in the background and could have sworn it was Brian talking. Well, it was Brian talking. We got a lot of comments like this. About like Brian being like me. Yeah. Well. Some person even said y'all look the same, you know, from far apart. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. But uh, a, lo- a lot of folks definitely saw or heard well, similarities in your in your tone, they were in your both, register. Both pretty couple of good looking, knowledgeable guys. That's so what I'll I, that's take what that I, as a compliment. It, it must have been that. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, and he's been here a while, so it's like, yeah, we have like a hive mind that all kind of, yeah. we all share each other's knowledge and stuff. So. He was also repeating some of your most oft-talked-about topics as well, so that oh, might have yeah. had something to do with it. We definitely both have completely coincidentally have very similar hobbies and interests. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, um, one more. The Jumping Nomad says, wow, what a pen cast. You guys answered two of my questions. The pencast is always a treat, but this one, you guys were literally just talking to me. And then Brian showing that gorgeous VAC 700 with the quill nib on it. The VAC 700 is one of my favorite looking pens, and the quill nib is my favorite nib. I might just try that conversion. Well, there you go. Franken penning some nibs. There were were no fewer than two people that said that they had already spoken to Brian and had done that. And love it. So I'm like, oh, God, Brian, (laughs) what are you doing? Oh, man, that's pretty fun. Cool. Well, I'm glad y'all enjoyed having him on, and we'll, you know, keep on bringing him back, and as well as others on the team. We got a few more that will line up for the future, but um, cool. Glad to know that you don't want to miss me that much because then I can be gone sometimes and not feel guilty about it. That is <laughs> that's true. actually a good thing. All right, um, let's move on to the, the segment of uh, new stuff. All right, we got some new stuff. I'm going to talk about it not having any much of an idea of what's happening. Just for a timeline here. So I was gone Tuesday through Saturday of this past week. And because of some conflicts, we had to move this to a Monday early afternoon recording. So I've had a couple of hours to prep things and catch up on like a whole week's worth of slacks and emails. So I'm going to talk as much as I know about these new things that are coming. I think I'm pretty okay on these ones though. Um, we have a new pen from Bennu. This is a new Bennu Euphoria, which has been a hot, hot model. We've done a bunch of exclusives. This one's not an exclusive, but it is a limited edition called Easter Bunny. And it's pretty cool. It's limited to 100 pens because it's one of these hand-painted dealios that looks so cool. So when the hand-painted stuff first started to come out, I was like, oh my gosh, this might be like the one hand-painted thing that ever comes out. Because that's really all we've seen. Yeah, and we didn't expect that from other we brands. would have as many available to us. Right. We, uh, for a while, they were only available through Benu Direct. Right. And then they started hiring more micro painters, and yeah. now they're offering it to retailers, and yeah. we're we're getting a surprisingly good and amount. Like rolling out a bunch of them. Yeah. Done some at, like all the major holidays. We've had we had yeah. one for Christmas, we had one for Valentine's Day, and now we're having another one for Easter. Yeah, and a couple of spring ones too. We've had some bird ones, and we had the Draco Darling too. That was just kind of like a random dragon, or maybe yeah. it was the year of the dragon. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. They're, they're just cranking them out for the holidays. I love it. Uh, so that pen is $280, so it's definitely cost more, but that's because it is more labor to do, and these artists need to get paid. So that's kind of cool. It looks really nice, though, um, if you're into Easter or bunnies, or the Easter bunny in particular. So um, go check that out. We will not have them for probably all that long. And then we have the new safaris, the Cliff and Blackberry. Violet, Bla- oh, sorry. Violet Blackberry, Pink Cliff, those are the pens, but we will have the ink to match the pen in a gift set. So it'll come with the pen, bottle, and cartridges, and a converter. So that'll be $44.99. You get that whole bundle together, and you'll be good to go. And uh, if you have not seen any of those yet, we did do a video on those with the pens and the ink all together, so you can check it out and see what is going on. And I think that's all I've got for right now because we've it. launched a ton so far. It's and a pretty light week. Yeah, we have a lighter week this week, and then it'll pick back up later yeah. in the month. The only other thing I have is <clears throat> Estherbrook 
is coming at you with a new SD model. Mm -hmm. If you'll remember, they did a stealth black. They did like an all black matte pen, and it was cool. It was lovely. It was neat. The most interesting thing about that, though, was that Raven Black is what they called it, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The most interesting thing about that, though, it came with a regular cartridge converter pen and a piston, which is not a thing Esterbrook has been doing, mm -hmm. but they did. But it wasn't just a regular twist piston. It was a pump piston, kind of like a Con 70 converter, but built into the pen. This one, now ready for your consumption, is the Winter White SD, both in cartridge converter form and that really cool piston form. So obviously the mm -hmm. cartridge converter one is going to be more affordable at $175.50, and then the piston version is $247.50. So you can choose what sort of filling mechanism you want. Obviously the ease of the cartridge converter is nice and easy and familiar if you just want that white, beautiful acrylic pen, but that filler on the um, piston button is really neat. My favorite thing about that is that I have seen modern-ish pens with a brass kind of button piston, mm -hmm. and they always feel a little grindy. Like, you can definitely hear them. Esterbrook mm. has manufactured this pen really, really smoothly, so it's mm. a, you don't even hear it. It's a smooth, non-grindy, non-scrapey operation. Yeah. Just a delight. I was really impressed when I saw that at a pen nice. show for the first time. It's awesome. So those are both available now. Mm-hmm. Very cool. <clears throat> Love me some pumpy pistons. I've heard that about you. On, on the Con 70, because that's like the only other pen that has it at all mm. that I can think of. But anyway, that's what we got for new stuff. You can check out uh, new arrivals and coming soon stuff on GooliePens.com to keep up with it. And we got a couple of quick company updates. All right, so it'll be fairly brief because, again, I don't really have any idea what's going on right now. And <laughs> we had so much going on with Lamy and stuff the last couple of weeks. Oh my God. We're kind of we're kind of cool with things just being a little chill at the moment. Um, but we do have a mental health half day <gasps> on Friday as this publishes on March 15th. So you'll probably have already seen this video by the time that has already passed. I'm going to publish it and leave. There you go. What should I do? What should you do? Do you oh, have any man. plans? I, yeah. I don't. I just, I, I realized we were having this as I saw your notes in here. Yeah, so I need to right. figure out something well. mentally healthy for me to do. Yeah. Think about it. Or mm. maybe you can get some, well, you can't get some suggestions because the time this publishes, it'll mm. have already happened. But I don't know. Maybe it'll still just like make its way out there in the universe and will have impacted you somehow. That's impossible because it'll happen after you've already done it. Never mind. I don't know what's going on. Mm. Um, I don't have any specific plans myself but I will give it some thought as well. Maybe I'll just go to Waffle House and then head home and play video games. That sounds like a mentally healthy situation. Amazing, yeah. yeah, do that. Mm. I think the weather's supposed to be nice. It's gonna be like in the 70s here in Virginia all week after today. Today's kind of gross, but tomorrow it'll get up in the 70s. So you can not be outside because you don't do that. I, I but tried I mean, to today. I was actually, I, yeah? I went home on my lunch break, heated up a bowl of chili, and I was gonna sit outside. Uh huh. Um, but uh, my dogs, they just eat random things in the backyard. Oh. And I'm just sitting there trying to enjoy my chili. I'm just like, stop it, stop it, hey, stop, stop, mm. stop it. I'm like, this is dumb. I'm going to go back inside. Interesting. You're just misbehaving. You know what I saw when I was at the airport coming back on Saturday? Corgi. Somebody had a dog oh. just straight up pooping <gasps> in the airport. Oh, my God. Just laying, laying turds That's right disgusting. there in the walking path. Oh, come and I was on. Like, well, first off, I was going to be like, you're going to pick that up, right? But then I was like, there's still going to be like sh smear, yeah. like remnants of it. Yeah. Like, is he going to like disinfect that oh or whatever? God. I was just like, I mean, people have animals in the airports. So like, I would assume you have a plan for that. Yeah. But I don't have a pet, so I don't really have to think about that kind of stuff. But it was I just mean, like, you're just not expecting to see that in an airport. Dog just, you know. Yeah. You know that face that <laughs> oh, dogs yeah. make? Oh, yeah. Sometimes so them, sometimes they look right at you, too. Oh, yeah. It's like it's like a self-defense thing. They, they need, they, they're vulnerable and they need to know that you're, You've got their back. Yeah. So they'll stare at you while they poop. Yeah. I mean, that's the same face I make when I poop. You just don't see it. Oh, cool. So that, well, I'm here know. for you, buddy. <laughs> Gross. Why are we talking about this? <laughs> anyway. Um, and then we have somebody that's having a special birthday next week, too. Oh, my God. So, yeah. Drew, my grandmother. Turning the big four. Oh. My grandmother texted me today, asked um, when I wanted to come over and have our little family celebration and what yeah. I wanted to eat. And I said, okay, we'll just do it on Wednesday on my actual birthday on the 20th. And then um, uh, I said, she didn't actually ask what I wanted. 
I mm. just told her, I'm like, hey, can you make apple pancakes? <laughs> because she used to make apple pancakes for us whenever we would stay over her house. And it's oh, yeah. been a long time. And I, yeah? said, I said, Mimi, I want some of your apple pancakes. Hey, nice. She's like, okay, well, that'll surprise a few people. <laughs> but <laughs> she's really all good. for it. She's like, oh, she's like okay, great. that sounds great. Perfect. Let's do that. I mean, it's your birthday. You get yeah. whatever the heck you want. So my, my mom funny. and my aunts, they're probably going to be like, wait, we're having what? <laughs> oh, man. That's so funny. <laughs> Is this like for dinner? Like yeah. Dinner time? Oh, yeah. yeah. Whatever, man. <laughs> yeah. Brenner, Brenner's the best. Absolutely. It's even better when it's a surprise. 100%. You don't know what's happening. That's awesome. And then uh, I'll get to make fun of how old you are for a month. For a month. Until yes. I turn old as well. And then Rachel will be able to make fun of you for a month. Yep. Not a month. Two weeks, basically. Oh, that's it? Yeah. Oh, wow. 17. She's 17 days younger than me. Oh, wow. I thought it was more than that. No. No. It's pretty close. But anyway. We'll both be old here pretty soon. Um, that's all we got for company updates. Uh, let's get into some Q&A, shall we? <clears throat> all right. I'm ready to go, Drew. I've been thinking so. about questions so much. I'm sure you so have much. not. <laughs> all right. Well, I will, um, mm. I'll softball you on this one. Mm. Um, Holishan okay. asks you, how many pens do you usually carry when traveling? Mm-hmm. I travel, when I travel, I also bring my journal. While I have a few mm-hmm. favorites to bring with me for long form writing, I will sometimes try to bring all of them, 15 so far. And mm-hmm. if they don't fit in my rickshaw koozie, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, no. And they, and they all don't fit. And they all don't fit in my rickshaw koozie. Oh, okay. I'd love to hear your thoughts around yeah, this. Thanks, minutes. Brian and Drew, for all you do. Well, thank you. You're we will welcome. continue to do all we do, um, which is not much, but it's good to know it's, it's enough. Um, Brian, you just recently traveled. I did. I'm so rifling through my goods right now. You're going to be able to, to say what exactly what you did. Yeah. I'll just start off by saying, while Brian gets all his stuff undone, I don't really travel with my pens. I just, I'm a very utilitarian writer. Um, I write when I need to, and I like writing, but I don't do a lot of journaling, and I don't, definitely don't journal when I'm on vacation or anything like that. Um, I have enough random junk to bring and uh unless i'm going to a pen show i mean i always bring pens to pen shows but yeah you got uh, to. for the most part i don't do a lot of traveling with my pens i'll bring a retro 51 and that's about it i traveled with more pens than i realized i see that i had some buried in here underneath all the cliff bars and rubik's cubes i usually do take a pen with me if i'm going to like some place where i think i might be asked about pens though yeah that's always fun yeah because i like talking about pens yeah do you I do. I just, <laughs> if I've got spare time, like when I'm on a trip, like I usually am sleeping or eating. And, Fair enough. Yeah. I guess it's different if it's like a vacation versus. Yeah. Like that, that's really the trip. only time I travel. If I'm, if, if, if for me, travel is either pen shows and I bring stuff or yeah. vacations where I don't bring stuff. That makes sense. Um, yeah. So I just traveled. I went to New Orleans. Uh, I've been there before. I went there five years ago for the very same type of conference that I just went to. Um, So that was cool. I will talk about that more in a minute. But I feel like, you know, for different types of travel, I will bring different types of things. You know, if it's something like a vacation, I'm not bringing a lot. You know, not that I vacate all that much. Yeah, like I just went to I'll Disney. Just bring the like, I didn't bring any pens to Disney. Like that. Just, yeah, you're not like God. No, taking any. I'm notes. ending the day exhausted. Yeah. I don't need to write anything. I'm just. Yeah, I'm uploading all my footage to the cloud and and mm-hmm. going to bed like that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I so I did just travel. So I went to like a non pen show, non like uh, what's it called? Like distributor, manufacturer, you know, tour, visit, whatever. I'll bring more pens to those type things because that's like work pen specific. Yeah, you were outside of the stuff. industry. Yeah, but this was a work conference. So it was like, I will be talking about pens sometimes to those who ask, and I need to take notes at said conference. But um, so it's kind of a, I guess, a reduced capacity yeah. of what I would bring. Yeah, obviously, if I'm taking, if I know I'm going to go to a place where I'm taking notes, then yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm bringing a pen. Exactly, exactly. And that's what this was. This yeah. was like a multi-day conference, lots of networking, lots of taking notes, breakout sessions, ideation, that type of stuff. So I used my traveler's notebook. Uh, which I've had this one. This is the olive one, which the OG version of it, which is a little darker than the one. Well I worn. Now. Well worn is I think partly it's darker because it's gotten all grimy with my I like it. oils. Uh, and I use Goulet notebooks inside of them. I keep several notebooks. I keep some lined ones and some dot ones. The lined ones are for like my personal stuff. 
the dot ones are for my business stuff. Oh. That way I can tell what the heck is going on in each notebook. And I usually have three notebooks in here because, you know, I have notebook challenges because I like to try different notebooks and then I write different things in them all the time and then I can't ever find what I wrote because I'm mixing and matching all the time. So this is my one that's like more of my go-to. So when I keep three of them in there, usually one of them is the most recent one that I have filled up so that if I need to like go back and reference something that I just, you know, did previously, I have that as kind of a reference for a while until I get into the new notebook, more time passes, and then I kind of archive the third one. So at least one dot, at least one lined, and then whichever the last one is that I filled, I leave that in there. And I did bring my endless notebook, yeah. which is actually a larger and better format for like conferences and stuff because it's more of an A5 size. However, I already had notes from like previous visits with oh. the same group in this notebook. So I ended up bringing both. I ended up not using this one. Plus, you know, there was like mingling events at different locations. I didn't want to bring a backpack. This is just a bit much even in my cargo shorts mm -hmm. to carry. This one I can like stick in the back pocket. I can stick it in my cargo shorts pocket and it's just convenient like that. So I ended up sticking with the traveler's notebook, even though it was a little a little narrower, you know, for the actual note taking and stuff like that. But I just did a lot of, a lot of bullet points. So that was good. And then I ended up bringing several different pens, some of which I forgot that I had in my backpack. So technically I brought them, but I did not use them. I had a couple of varsities in here, I think because I shot a video about the varsities not too long ago, and I meant to bring these back home. I put them in my backpack and forgot to ever take them out. Were, at those, home. were either of those the one you refilled on camera? Uh, no. Oh, okay. No, that one's still here. These are just ones I was going to bring home and let my kids mess with. Oh, so gotcha. I have those. So it's a, the green and the purple one. Um, and then I also have my main note taking one was my supposed to be 580 ALR Prussian Blue that I have inked up with an ink. I forgot what color is in here because it's been in here a while. Blue water ice. It's a blue. It could be blue water ice. I don't know if it is though, mm. to be honest with you. <sighs> I really don't remember what color it is. I have too many blues that are too similar and it's, I've had this ink in here for a while, but I do like that pen. I especially like this pen for when I go to conferences where I'm talking to other business people that like may or may not care about pens at all because I always have to explain like, what is a fountain pen? And it's nice because it's demonstratory and I can show what's going on. So that is cool and I can show the ink sloshing around and people get it. I um, also have a Lamy 2000 Rollerball. I think because I just threw that in my backpack and I just like, I just, it's always there as my backup in nice. case I forget to ever clean out any of my pens. I've got a pen that will work and be a nice writing experience. And then I brought a couple others that were thoughtful like, I have my oh. Pilot Custom Rear Sheet. I did not bring this one though, this oh. I left here, oh. but I like to carry it around in my daily here. So I put it back in there, but I did not bring it with me on the trip. But I do have my Lamy 2000 with a fine nib on it and some kind of blue ink in it. And then I have Twisby Eco. This is the, uh, shoot, what is this one called? The one with the rose gold trim, Bron it? bronze trim, sorry. <laughs> The bronze, yeah. Is it indigo? No, not indigo. Indigo. Is it indigo? Indigo with bronze trim. Indigo. Yep. Okay. Yep. So that is cool. That's also a good pen to show people like what is going on with the ink and stuff like that. Oh, I got a little ink on the grip from I the plane. That. Yeah, that's not too bad. I always like to see like, I, I took zero precautions whatsoever in taking these on the plane. Now I see I got a little ink on the grip, so it can happen, but whatever. I'll wipe that off and it's not a big deal. The other ones, uh, there was like no leaking whatsoever on any of these, so yeah, totally fine. Lamy 2000, okay. The 2000 fine. Well, that one's a rollerball, so oh. that one is perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah no ink on that here, group. Not any ink at all. That's weird. Whatsoever, yeah. yeah. So, a little bit on the eco, but that's interesting. Um, okay, and then what else was I gonna talk about? How many pens do I take? So, I really had like those, the three pens. That was like, you know, the, oh, and then I had another one. I forgot about my uh, Travelers. Travelers, yeah. So I had that little guy. I had to remember because I always carry a pocket knife. It's like when every time I fly, I'm like, I have to take the knife out of my pocket. Um, so my little traveler's pen, which I have uh, Dimine Red Dragon in there, which I recently cleaned and refilled. So I had it, I mean, I think I had the same cartridge that I'd refilled in there for maybe three or four months. 
and I had not yet gone through the whole cartridge because it's just like, I always have other pens around, but that yeah. one is just nice when I need to sign a little thing. So clean that out, took it with me on the trip. Let me see if that one did anything crazy on the plane. Nope, it literally just I've, looks fine. I've only ever had internal piston pens do anything on planes. Yeah, cartridge converters really are. I've do never it. had that There's happen. not enough air in there to really cause no. anything. Yeah, it's like bigger ones like this, like where it's like half inked or whatever. But it looks like your Eco is more full than that one is. I think it was about the same, the Eco is. Well, maybe not. Yeah, a little bit of, it was about halfway here. It's really clinging to the. Oh, okay, it's hard there. to tell. So it's got, it's got a decent amount of air in there. It's maybe a little little more than half filled. Um, but yeah, that's the thing. And I guess that one, I don't, you know, I think that happened on the way back, but I had two legs. So it was like four ups and downs. Yeah. So, you know, it makes sense that something might happen on some of these pens. Um, yeah. So that, that's pretty good for traveling for me. I, you know, if I'm going to a pen show, I will carry more pens. I'll do like more 20, 30 pens and I'll be in like a good range. You know, I always try to carry like my original custom 74 and you know stuff like that that people kind of know me for but i don't want to bring pens like that on a work conference trip because if i lose my bag or somebody steals it or whatever i want it to be like fairly replaceable pens yeah but also ones that like do a good job representing what nice fountain pens are um so yeah there's that uh and then the only other time that i'll bring more pens with me is if i'm going to visit my in-laws uh, or spending like, you know, more than a couple of days away from home because that is sometimes an opportunity for me to clean some pens. So it's like, oh, if everybody's just kind of around the house and we don't really have like a planned activity and I can sneak away for a little bit, I will clean some pens. Not always though, but sometimes I do. And that is helpful. So like Christmas time or whatever, you know, when I'm like going up for a week and it's like, all right, what the heck are we going to do for a week? I'll bring that just in case. So that's time when I'm bringing more pens that I'm not going to be showing people. It's just to do something with. Yeah. Like I'll, I'll bring, I'll bring, uh, I have a separate pen case with pens that I are happy to trade. So those mm. just sit in the separate pen case. I'll usually bring those to pen shows just in case I see something. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. That's a good idea. Cool. That's pretty much it for me. Um, love to hear what y'all have to say about your pen travel things and how thoughtful you are about it. You know, do you bring 15 pens with you everywhere you go? I would not judge you because Currently, I'm carrying around 40 pens around in my backpack because, again, I have ones I need to clean. I keep bringing them back and forth from home to work. And uh, yeah, I'm as always, even if I did carry, <laughs> you know, inked up pens with me, there would ever only be three. There would never be more than three. So you're sticking to it, man. Yeah. Respect. Well, respect. I just, I, I'm, I'm always validated because I, whenever I have to clean my three pens, I'm like, this sucks. I hate this. <laughs> I don't want to ever do this more than three times in three instances at a time. Mm. Yeah, like, there's definitely a limit to the. I've even thought about like maybe pens. I should do two at a time. I hate Whoa. cleaning pens so much. Well, you know, you have to clean the same number of pens no matter how many you carry, right? No, because I never exhaust all three of them. Like if I only carried two, yeah, I would. It's not like I would have to carry for you know. I, it's not like I would empty them faster because I mm. have fewer inked up. I just I wait until I've exhausted yeah. one and then I switch out all three. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm rarely exhausting all of the ink in them. They're usually drying out before I yeah need oh. to clean them. Oh no, none of mine dry out. But yeah, so I mean, I guess theoretically, if you're using them all, so you said then, like, what do you mean by dry out? Like the all the ink in the converter goes away? Uh, maybe not that. Oh, okay. That would be pretty extreme. Just dry out to the point where like dry where it's like oh it's gotten all like crusty. I need to it's this not needs like to be clean before it's not I, like writing properly yeah, anymore, okay. and I forgot what ink I put in it, yeah. and yeah, <laughs> that that's usually you know a couple of months goes by, I haven't taken good notes on what I filled with what, and it's like okay I think it's time I don't remember when I last filled this pen that's probably a good sign that it's yeah. time to clean it out. All right, Drew, I got a question for you. Yeah, this one kind of goes. Rob, it's a nice segue. Rob Taggart. Yep. Hey, Rob. How do you know when you have too many pens? Gasp. Rob, <gasps> wrote, Rob wrote gasp. How do you pick just three to use each week? Looking at you, Drew. Especially if you have a lot of special or limited editions. And it's hard to give those away or sell them to make room for new ones. That is a good question. Well, I will say right now, I already feel like I have too many. Because I recently mm. bought a 40 pen case, the Esther Brook. That's canvas right. pen case yeah. and i'm like this feels like how many pens i should have mm. and i 
and I filled it all up and I mm -hmm. had more. And I'm like, ah, oh, <laughs> this is not what I want. Yeah. So I looked at it, I'm like, this is a lot of pens. And why do I need more than this? I really don't. And here, here's why I think, Rob, I have too many pens. Is because when I look at all of my pens, when I, because I did that recently when I got the new mm. case, when I looked at them all, I did not look at them and feel joy by looking at all of my pens. Oh. I felt sad what? because I have not been giving them all the attention that I think they deserve. Hmm. I look at them and, and I feel like I'm not doing right by them. I feel like I'm I'm hmm. it, it's like it's like owning a bunch of pets that you're not snuggling and cuddling <laughs> all uh, equally. You can and snuggle and cuddle, cuddle forty pens, you know? I haven't been though. That's oh, the thing. Like hmm. they I haven't been they haven't been able to play. And some of them are just like sitting in their little dog crate and not able to go in the backyard and run around and <laughs> I keep just you know letting the same ones outside to run and some of the other mm. ones just stay in the crate and it makes me feel really bad so like well, that that's that tells me you know what if I don't feel like I'm using mm. them you know giving them the life that I want to give them <laughs> Maybe that's a sign yeah, that you go I, to a farm upstate. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know, or, or just to you know move them along to somebody that is going to appreciate them mm. in a way that I have not been able to. So that is personally my sign. Like, what do you mm. what do you think when you look at your collection? Do you look at it and say, "Behold, my stuff," or do you look at it and be like, "Oh," yeah. and you see all these ones? Oh, I want to write with that. I want to write with that. I want to write. You know that that's where mm. I'm at. So that's why mm. I feel like I need to downsize a little bit because. I do love them so much and you know I need to like if you love something so much sometimes you got to let it go. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I'm at um but uh it really just depends on how much you know joy you get from you know having and using versus having and holding, you know. Mm -hmm. I have hobbies where I do collect things and I am perfectly happy staring at the collection being like, "Yeah, my stuff." Like Retro video games. I collect Super mm -hmm. Nintendo, Nintendo, Genesis, N64, I all that. Yeah. And I'm perfectly fine just letting them sit around. Like, I, it's not easy to huh. hook up all those old gaming systems to a modern TV yeah. and switch between cartridges. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I display a few of them and I store the rest. And that's okay. fine. If I actually want to play something, I'll play something on, you know, an emulator or, you know, a handheld device mm. or something I have hacked, you know. But I'm fine having them just as a collection mm. that makes that brings me joy but that's different that that's just a, that's how that's where that hobby lays in my own brain mm. with fountain pens that's not where the hobby lies for fountain pens it's much more of a use hobby like i want to be interacting with these things constantly mm. so it occupies a different space in my hobby brain so mm. um and that might be different for you i, I know that for you and your collection it's very different like you you your collection serves a very different purpose than mine does mm -hmm. so it does depend on what your collection means for you and what you want your fountain pen journey to ultimately look like. Mm. So that's how I um, have mm. decided. As far as how I pick my three pens, it changes a lot, uh, but I do use arbitrary rules every time. So <laughs> sometimes it's just a matter of me opening up my case and feeling guilty enough for ones that have been neglected to say like, well, I haven't wrote, written with that for a long time. Let me show you some love because I mm. just feel bad. Mm. Um, and that's 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 the wrong reason. Like I should, I want to write with pens that I get excited about, not pens that I'm guilted into writing. You feel with. obliged and to write like, with. I was the same way when I was a kid, Brian. If I really like, if I, because you know, I'd have a bed full of stuffed animals, right? Ah. And I would have my favorites, but then there'd also be the the thing at, you know at the bottom of the bed that you got from the claw machine. Yeah. And you're like, ah, it's kind of scratchy. I don't really want to. I don't want that to be like my main snuggle thing. Yeah. But also, it's like looking at me and. It's like, all right, it's, you know, it's like a... It doesn't have feelings, though. I know, but it's it, it does. Object. It does, though. So I'm like, mm. all right, come here. I'm like, ah, oh, this sucks. It's, it's like <laughs> okay. some scratchy Donkey Kong or something. Right, I don't know. Right. But um, yeah, I've always been like that. <laughs> it's okay. like, I just feel bad. Um, so sometimes I just choose about a pen that I feel bad for. Uh, this time it was ink. I um, actually picked what ink I wanted to write with first. So mm. I wanted to write with Waring Gold, Phantom of the Opera, Robert Oster, Thunderstorm, because we talked about the ink names. Right. I'm like, I need to write with Thunderstorm soon. Yeah. And then Robert Oster, Honeybee. So, okay. So um, you wanted the pens to match the inks that you chose. Somewhat, chosen. somewhat, yeah. yeah. Or but at least compliment. Yeah. Um, so the um, pen that I put Thunderstorm in is this Scribo pen with a nice gray blue 
ink hmm. uh, or gray blue resin and okay. that just like matches perfectly with the ink it's just a dead ringer so hmm. that's how i picked that one okay. um i hadn't yet inked up my you know crazy garage fountain pens uh urushi uh kakuno, kakuno yet yeah. so this one has a bunch of colors this one has brown and purple and blue and sparkly so this one can really you can put anything in this so this one mm -hmm. i did a uh, wearing gold phantom of the opera okay. um and then uh i wanted robert oster honeybee so i wanted a nice it's a gold color so i thought that my um was this apollo um visconti mirage mythos mm -hmm. would be a great um choice for honeybee so yeah, i that's good i found the gold ink and i picked a pen that i thought had a nice gold vibe also this pen has a medium nib which i have fewer of mm. but honeybee is a great shader so yeah. i wanted a larger nib for that yeah so this time rob i started with the ink and then matched the ink to mm -hmm. pens that i thought worked well with it definitely um definitely. but you know the craziest thing happened when i inked these up i picked up this kakuno brian wrote with it and my feeling was you know what i could I, i'd be good with just a kakuno like it wrote, what? it wrote that good. I am so satisfied with this crazy Arushi Kakuno that I'm like, you know what? This would be enough for me. Is that your Highlander pen? If there could only be one. I, I, I feel like if I did just have, like, I could write all day with the Kakuno. I could write all month with the Kakuno. It's, it, it's this it's particular done. one. It, it just, it's fantastic. Wow. So I feel like if I had to. I could be one of those people that, and it makes me wonder, like if I didn't work here, hmm. how big would my collection be? Like if I, if I wasn't tempted as often hmm. as I'm tempted, what, what would my collection look like? How, what kind of a hobbyist yeah. would I be? I might just have a few. I think I could probably, yeah, I think I would have, I, I think I would have 10, 10 or fewer if yeah. I wasn't just constantly. We are around them in the, all Yes, the in the bubble. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I probably, I, I definitely would not have anywhere near the pens that I yeah. have if I was not in this business. Um, I don't know how many I would have if I was just, you know, a it's a, hobbyist. It's, it's tough. You'll, we'll never know because no. that's never going to be a situation that can happen. Um, but knowing how obsessive some of my other hobbies are, I probably wouldn't have a small collection because I don't really have a small collection of pretty much anything that I yeah. get involved in. Yeah. Because I, for me, so it's a little different. I don't have, I don't have ill feelings about the neglect that I have for my various pens. Right. Um, it's not quite the same way. Uh, it's more of like, I like to have pens to reference and use because I'm a very tactile person and my part of how I remember things is by physical objects. So I'm one of those people that like, I like to have like trinkets or something. Like if I go to a place and I have an object that I have from that place, yeah then when I like ha interact with that object, I then remember being at that place. Um, so for me, it's a little more of like, I like to have things around even if I'm not using them very much because the very fact that I have them and see them and can lay hands on them, even if I'm not writing with a pen, I will have like associations and good feelings with that. Yeah, just by just by it be kind of being in the collection. I feel like you mentioned that in <clears throat> regards to some of the things you brought back from Japan, like mm -hmm. the knives and the little wooden puzzle box. Yeah, like definitely. you talked about that connection there. That yeah. like, you know, you're bringing a little piece of it back with you. Yeah, I think that definitely. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, and it's just like the way my brain works, you know, yeah. a little bit. Um, and then you know, especially like with me, um, I like I'm like kind of a generalist. So it's like, I like to have a diversity of experience when I get into a hobby. So with fountain pens, like even before I was really kind of in the business, so to speak, when I was trying to just learn about fountain pens, I bought all completely random brands, you know, random nib sizes. I intentionally overlapped as little as possible so that I could get a range of experiences. Um, and it really continues to today. So it's like, very few pens, even if it's like a new model or color exclusive or something that I'm like, well, I know I'm going to set one of those aside. Oftentimes, if I'm trying to pick like a nib size or something like that, I will often go, well, what nib size do I not have in that pen? And I'll go for that one. Even if I don't think I would use it that often, I like to have access to it. Yes. You know what I mean? I've heard I've heard that firsthand. Yeah. And that's Especially with Twisby Ecos, like you're always trying to like, all right, what did I do last time? And Yeah, I mean, some of them, it's a little different now with like Ecos and Lamy's and stuff like that because I can I can swap those nibs around. Yeah. So it's not quite as big of a deal to me. Like once I have 
a number of them and yeah. I have kind of like all the nibs covered, then it's kind of like, okay, whatever. Whatever is the last one that will sell, yeah. I'll take that one because, you know, I don't want to take somebody else's pen that wants it quickly. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it rolls for me. I do not limit myself to number of pens in any way no. that are inked up at one time. I'm inking up pens way faster than I'm cleaning them at any given time. Um, so that is a thing. What else did I have? Did I have anything else in my notes? Um, oh yeah, I don't know what it means to have too many. I think it's subjective. You know, I definitely have moments where I'm looking at my collection. I'm like, yeah, this is kind of a lot. But then when I actually start going through the drawers and looking at them all, there's some that I'm like, I could easily cut out like 10% of the collection. Yeah. Pretty easily if I had to. Um, but there's other ones that I'm like, yeah, a lot of these are like historical reference exclusives and, you know, various versions of things that are like super rare. They're prototypes. They're, you know, whatever things that I'm like, ah, these are kind of irreplaceable. So I am definitely like a, by default, keep it. Um, but if I like really, really had to, I could let, I could let a bunch go. Um, I would say there's no right or wrong answer for anybody for this. It's a very personal question as to how many pens is too many. I would say kind of like you alluded to, Drew, if you feel like burdened by them, or if it's like, you know, causing you financial problems because you're spending too much on pens, which hopefully no one's in that situation, but like any hobby, you can definitely spend more money than you intend or that you really should. So things like that, that are like, those are not particularly great. Um, and I would say <laughs> a somewhat more objective thing is like, if you have to keep a spreadsheet of them because you can't remember what you have, maybe that's a sign, <laughs> but I don't know. I like to keep track of all that. So I have, definitely have a spreadsheet and I've had one for a while. I have a spreadsheet mainly to, you yeah. know, you know uh, keep track of value. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, if there's like data about it, like when you acquired it and how much you paid for it and all that kind of stuff, that makes sense to keep in a spreadsheet. But. And if, I, if you ever need to worry about like, insuring them at some point true. you want to that's know true. how much they're worth that's true that's, a, that's not a bad way to go too so yeah anyway appreciate the question it was a fun little prompt yeah all right question three comes to us from vanessa and vanessa asks mm -hmm. i have a question regarding what criteria has to be met to become a goulet exclusive pen mm -hmm. i love banu and i know this is one company that does a lot of exclusives only to yourselves which is great when i'm in the u.s but not when i'm in the uk Ooh, yeah. i just have to hope that they do not sell out before my next trip back to the u.s so i was wondering for exclusivity is this based on predicted sales of their products that get you exclusivity Thanks for being a great company and helping me grow my collection. Thank you, Vanessa. You're very welcome. Thanks for supporting us. Um, okay, so in terms of what defines an exclusive, you know, it pretty much is what you would think. Um, it's basically something that you can only get through one retailer. Um, sometimes there's like a particular regional exclusive, like maybe a North American exclusive or something like that. Um, but we do a lot of Goulet exclusives. And you know, there's various levels of what that looks like and the process for doing that uh, can range a little bit. So I'll explain kind of what these are. Um, so there are products that we develop ourselves, like ink samples, pen flush, the ink vial holders, you know, stuff that we are like designing or maybe manufacturing that is not something that would exist out in the world unless we did it. Um, not that other people can't do their own samples and stuff like that, but basically like we're making it like truly happen. Um, that's what we can call like an evergreen exclusive. It's something that we just want to make. We want to sell it all the time. We restock it. We just keep it because it should exist. Um, and so that we're always sourcing it ourselves. We'll buy whatever quantity is needed. It's going to vary a lot depending on whatever the product is and where we get it and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's, it's really just kind of up to us. So, you know, and, and it's also up to us to like promote it and let you know that they exist and pricing and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's the most autonomous type of products that we carry. Um, other ones, you know, you mentioned Banu, you know, basically other brands. Um, we're not like white labeling anything from any pen brands. We don't have like a Goulet branded pen. This is a much more common thing in other industries, you know, like a lot of the products. So you think about like Kirkland, any, yeah, Kir yeah, basically Kirkland equate up and up like any generic brand of anything like Target or Walmart, like they're not manufacturing this stuff. There's like somebody that's making this for them and they're putting their name on it. Um, so we don't do any of that necessarily. Um, all the exclusives that we have pretty much are, you know, like Banu. It's a Banu thing and it's just an exclusive. So, you know, whatever. Um, so there are a couple different ones we have. We might have a timed or a launch exclusive. So that would be a product that would be available at other retailers eventually excuse me, but we might be the first ones to get it. Maybe for the first 30 or 90 days, 
you know, we might be the only ones that have it and then it can open up to others. We've done that before. Um, this is really good for products where we think there will be some demand for it, but not enough for us to meet uh, what's called the MOQ. This is the minimum order quantity. So basically for any manufacturer to make anything, there's time in R&D developing, you know, coming up with the SKUs and pictures, all that stuff. You know, there's like a certain, you know, they have to place minimum quantities for whatever material they're doing. So there's, you know, going to be a certain number. It's going to depend on the price point and the manufacturer. It's, it's different. It's kind of all over the place. Um, but that's always where the conversation starts is, you know, how many would we need to buy in order to do an exclusive? Um, so brands that are smaller are more nimble and they have more flexibility, maybe. Um, brands that are larger, you know, you have to commit to a higher quantity and, and it all depends. So that's always like the most important part of the conversation when kicking that off is, can we even afford to buy as many? Do we think we have the demand for that exclusive? Because it's like, basically it has to be enough demand just purely through us. Um, and it doesn't always make sense. So, um, you know, the, the thing that works really well for a timed or a launch exclusive, you know, the manufacturer will get basically like a guaranteed sale from us because we're committing to a certain number of them. Um, and then by the time it opens up to other retailers, that's fewer pens overall that they're going to have to commit to selling. So it's relatively low risk for them. Sometimes it's, you know, it's more risk probably on us as the retailer. The manufacturer is fine. They're probably going to sell them no matter what because um, it's usually somewhat smaller batches of pens. Um, and, uh, you know, it's usually like if there's a U.S. distributor, they're usually committing to the full allotment. And then, you know, if they're not sure if there's going to be enough demand from other retailers, but we can say, you know, just as an example, say the minimum order is 300 pens or something. And if we say, well, we can get a timed exclusive, we'll commit to 100 pens. And then the other 200 you can sell through other retailers. That might be worth it for them. We might say like, yeah, we think there's demand for 100 pens. We can maybe sell most of them within that time frame, And then kind of everybody wins. Um, whereas they may be on the fence about doing it if, you know, they've got to speculate and, you know, try to sell all 300 to different retailers. So um, sometimes that can work. Um, uh, but a true exclusive is the one that like we'll work with a pen brand and we'll be like, we're going to be, we're going to get the entire run. So, you know, whatever it is. If like Benu. A, yeah, like Benu. So they'll say, usually the manufacturer will say, this is the minimum that you need to order for us to, for it to, you know, kind of be worth our time of making this exclusive thing. A lot of times we can order more than that if we think there's really hot demand. Sometimes it's, it depends on like the material. You know, if it's like a single batch of material or something like that, and it's kind of hard to coordinate ordering that, you know, that's sometimes where we've had, you know, something where we come out with something and then, you know, we might sell out initially and it takes like four to six months to restock. That's usually because it takes that long to get materials and make another batch of it. So we usually try to kind of get it right from the very beginning so that it doesn't like have these huge delays in between. Um, we can't always get it right, but we, that's what we'll try to do. So oftentimes we will try to you know, there's no magic formula for any of this. We have to do a lot of number crunching and look at previous sales and stuff like that. But Especially the first one. Yeah, exactly. If it's something like a Banu and we've done like several euphorias or something like that, we're like, okay, we have a little more data to go off of maybe, but even still it's like, what time of year is it? What else is coming out at that time? How saturated? Like, are people sick of euphoria? Is like, I mean, who knows? It's We've got a something. lot of data on exclusive retro 51s, and those are still a big old mystery. Yeah, those always kind of keep us guessing. They're, 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 they they're can be a little hit or miss for us. But um, yeah, so it's like, it's, it's part art and it's part science, right? Which is, you know, part of what keeps it so fun and interesting. Um, but it's a huge investment for us as the retailer because, you know, basically when we're buying you know, a large lot of pens, you know, that's typically the size of, of, you know, an order that a distributor would be placing who might sell to hundreds of retailers in a region, you know, just in the US, like there might be, I don't know, a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand retailers. So if a distributor picks up a pen and it's 500 pens, they will probably not have a problem selling 500 pens to their various retailers. Whereas we as one retailer, 500 pens, that can be a lot. So it really depends. We got to really kind of be excited about it. Feel like it's going to do something, you know, exciting for the community. Um, and like the colors on trend and stuff like that. So there is a lot of kind of 
you know, faith and guesswork that we have to put into these things. Um, and then also we're probably not going to sell out of them super quickly. So, you know, typically part of, you know, anybody who's worked in the retail environment, you know, you live and die by how you manage your inventory. So it's like if every product we ordered took us like a year or two to sell, that would be a lot of money just tied up sitting there forever. And it would really kind of put a chokehold on running our business. So we have to try to refresh things. And, you know, we, we average on hand keeping, you know, between like 45 and 60 days, you know, worth of stuff on hand, you know, if we can get restocked fairly quickly, you know, that can be, you know, shorter if it needs to be. But, um, you know, we're not just, we don't have an endless, you know, bank account. So we, we can't just buy and hold as much of all the inventory that we ever want. So we do have to weigh that out pretty heavily when we're doing exclusives. Like, is it going to take, you know, 45 days or two and a half years to sell this number of pens and how much money is that time? We've seen both. We definitely have. Um, So yeah. Uh, So, you know, just for an example, a pen like the Lamy Vista Black that we launched, it'll be two years ago here this summer. We knew that we were going to have that for a while because we had to place a very, very high minimum quantity order. Um, and that was okay. We did that knowing that we were going to have it for a while because the opportunity to, to get that exclusive was that it, worth it to us. Um, whereas something like a Banu would be, you know, far shorter than that. So it really depends. And it's like, because the prices on pens can range so much too, that really comes into play as well. Um, so it's really different for every brand. Um, and I'll say like, there's some brands that we have that we haven't ever done an exclusive on because it just doesn't make sense and, or whatever. And there's others where it makes a lot more sense and we do them all the time. You know, I would say Banu in particular, they're so responsive and they're so creative. I think they just like really enjoy getting to come up with these different ideas yeah. and stuff. And we we feed off of that with them where everybody's having a good time. Y'all are enjoying them. They're selling. So that's one that makes sense. We give them a lot of ideas. Not everything works out. You know, we give them... You know, probably out of every pen that we're able to make happen, it's probably at least two or three other designs that we've asked them about that doesn't make sense in a pen. But they will always try. They always They're try. not afraid of anything. Yeah, they've done some samples of some things, and we're like, yeah, that just doesn't look as good as what we were hoping. But they will always try. They will try. And then some some companies just don't do exclusives. <clears throat> um, yeah. It's, you know, and that's just the way it is. That's true. Yeah, but I would say, like, in general, like, I always think about this because like if I was a manufacturer, you know, they're making things, they've got this production schedule, they're doing all this stuff. Like there's not as much benefit, I would have to believe, like financially for a manufacturer to do a single retailer exclusive as there is for us as the retailer, right? Right. So like we, I think, benefit more. So I think a lot of the manufacturers, the reason they do it is because Honestly, it's like it, it just keeps things, I don't know, fresh and interesting for them. Gives yeah, them and I challenges. think that they know that if a retailer gets an exclusive, that will be promoted heavily. And yeah. Therefore, yeah, their it's, brand it's more, gets promoted. It's probably more of like an overall branding yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like f- not necessarily free marketing, but it is yeah. kind of like an additional marketing. Yeah. For and them. I will say that um, to speak to your point, the only yeah. point I was going to add to this was that uh, in general, you might be wondering like what why are exclusives beneficial Mm. and i think that exclusive pens or an exclusive product for any retailer in any industry these days Mm. with the presence of large 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 companies like amazon who Mm. um you know smaller retailers like ourselves like any other fountain pen retailers on the planet really uh we're all more competing against amazon than we are with each other in a lot of ways and any retailer exclusive fountain pen is something that uh, that retailer can have that a company like Amazon cannot have. Mm -hmm. And it allows smaller companies to compete against much larger companies via unique value proposition. Yeah, and it keeps things more exciting for you all. Honestly, and it's kind of rewarding too, I think, for um, you as the end user, um, because we're engaging with you all directly. You know, you're not, I mean, you might be able to engage sort of directly with a brand, you know, a manufacturer, but it's not the same as engaging directly with a retailer like us. So we are going to be probably more responsive to some of the uh, designs and and colors and things like that, that are more special and unique and, you know, more specific that wouldn't have as broad of appeal, but we can go super, super narrow, very specific and develop things. And by having that exclusivity for us, it allows us to, you know, maybe kind of weigh out the risk 
with the potential benefit of having that exclusive lock on a design. And then we can go a little crazier, like an arcade carpet rickshaw case, for example, or other various, you know, kind of or out there things that we've done. Found a rollerball with a pirate on it. There you go. So it's fun. It also keeps things fun and interesting for us as it does for you. So it's definitely beneficial, but you know, that's, that's sort of a little bit of a behind the scenes of how it works. So yeah. thanks for asking the question. All right, Drew, you yes. got some good stuff to talk about this one. I'm excited for this. All right, Doug Spooky <laughs> says, what would you recommend for Disney inspired pens? Now, you just went to Disney, so are you I did, but sure I've always got, got Disney on my mind. So that's yeah. not, I didn't even, I forgot about this question when I wore my shirt. Up. I was going to say, is that planned? Because you're no, definitely wearing a Disney shirt. No, I just did. I actually brought this to Disney, didn't end up wearing it. So, oh, it, was, really? so it was one of my like already ironed shirts. Oh, nice. Um, so, mm. yeah, it was just, just happened to work. Um, I will say that that's a very broad concept. I didn't know if um, Doug here is talking about, you know, specific characters or just kind of like Disney theme overall, mm. like how many Disney characters are there? Are you including Marvel oh and Star Wars? I don't know. Um, so I just went with kind of like the classic characters, you know, got some princesses, got some villains. So the news coming out with a uh, uh, pen called the Steamboat Master, which has Steamboat Willie on it. So mm -hmm. you can't really get much more Disney than that, mm -hmm. um, even though Disney is not going to be mentioned in the product description in any way. Nope, um, that is still trademarked. It is, but Steamboat Willie is not. So um, yeah, if you wanted Steamboat Willie, not Mickey, Steamboat Willie, mm -hmm. on your fountain pen, the Banu Steamboat Master is the way to go. So apart from that, though, um, I did pick a few that I think match up well. And really, one of the best matches you can find is just to go through and look at the currently available Sailor Pro Gear Slims and past available Pro Gear Slims. Because if you wanted princess pens, these are the pens that you should be going to. Because the color combinations, you usually get a cap that's different than the barrel. Depending on what version of what princess you want, you've got a lot of options there. The most obvious one is Sailor Follow the Mermaid. Because not only is it a mermaid themed pen, but it really does have Ariel's kind of purple and green vibe going on already. So that one's kind of a no brainer. Um, and also, I'd like to mention that uh, Ariel is the only Disney princess that has proven to have excellent cursive handwriting. Mm. Because mm -hmm. even underwater, she like just kind of leaned off and <laughs> scribbled her name with one hand, and it looked marvelous. It looked pretty good. She yeah. had a nice little flourish, you know. So respect to Ariel Urs for that. Ursula, too, had respectable handwriting, I will say. Did she sign her name? Well, I assume she wrote the contract. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. So, you know. Yeah, excellent. So those 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 mermaids and whatever Ursula is. Um, and then she's if you a wanted, sea witch. yeah, she's an octopus, right? Isn't yeah, yeah, half octopus. But what do you call yeah. like? What do you? Yeah, what, you, what is a mermaid equivalent of a half octopus? Right. Um, and then I noticed that the uh, Sailor uh, Pro Gear Slim Nadashiko is a pretty good pink and white match for Princess Aurora or Sleeping Beauty. And if you wanted to keep on going with the uh, Pro Gear Slims, Fuki is a pretty dead ringer for a Tiana's kind of green look. However, if you didn't want to go with Tiana's more formal attire, you can rock the Bennu Luminous Neon, which has some crazy glow in the dark. Ness, and then you've got green and purple, which definitely has more of a Mardi Gras vibe. If you wanted to go the Tiana New Orleans route, it's not exactly Tiana centric, but it's New Orleans centric, which obviously, mm -hmm. and the glowingness we can say has a little bit of Ray, the firefly kind of nodding a little bit. If we wanted yeah. to go deep, you know, don't make me light up my butt. Uh, <laughs> Real quick. Mulan. Oh yeah. Real quick. Uh, there is a word for a half human, half octopus. Uh, it's a Cecalia, C E C A E L I A. Okay. Cecalia, Cecalia. I don't know. And also, uh, according to Wikipedia, Ursula's occupation is sorceress Faustian bargainer. Wait. Oh, Faustian. Oh, Faustian. Gotcha, yes. Faustian. Yes. Yeah. The whole sorceress deal with the devil thing. Faustian bargainer. All right. Sounds very fancy. Yeah, anyway, there you go. Legit. Learn something new. Half human, half octopus. Um, I thought about Mulan because obviously the Year of the Dragon Pen by Visconti mm, um, mm -hmm. is pretty accurate there. I'm not trying to just phone it in because like, oh, she's Chinese, this Chinese. Literally, the dragon clip looks like Mushu, though. Like that's a, True. it looks just like him. Um, it's kind of a fancy pen, though. It Mul is a fancy Mulan's pen. Mulan's not very fancy. No, she's not. But know? I will say that she has a lot of different attire throughout that True. show. She's got her casual stuff. She's got her armor. She's got, you know, out without the armor, she got this final formal wear at the end. So she doesn't really have a trademark set of colors. Mm. Um, but, uh, and what colors she does have, have like more than three. So I'm sure there's a Pro Gear Slim that 
more accurately captured Mulan's colors in the past. I looked through hours, couldn't find a dead ringer, but I'm sure that there's some that could work depending on which version of Mulan you're going with. Um, uh, a Pelican M200 in pastel blue is what I'm choosing for Belle because it's blue and white, which is kind of her you know normal you know, casual attire. That's a pretty good choice. But here's the yeah. thing about Belle. Any fountain pen is a Belle fountain pen because it got me thinking she would totally be a fountain pen nerd. She oh, yeah, would, like, of course. And then I started thinking, well, hold on. A lot of these princesses. Ariel would definitely right? be a fountain pen nerd. So that, that got me thinking. Come you've on. got Ariel. You've got Belle. Absolutely Rapunzel. Like, oh, yeah. There are a lot of princesses that would definitely like to, yeah, be all, like planner girls. Lot of princesses are little, like, there are a lot of hoarders in the princess, Disney and, princess and, world. And, and collectors and art yeah. artists. Like yeah. Rapunzel is a, a super accomplished artist. For sure, yeah. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these girls would love fountain pens. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm, I got super excited about that. Also, I think that uh, Elsa, you know, not Anna, but Elsa, I could see her being a fountain pen person. She's, you, you don't know, think Anna would be a fountain pen person? No, she's too, she'd drop them. All the time, <laughs> she could have she could have a traveler's pen. She's not responsible enough. No, so. she's not. I wouldn't trust. I mm. wouldn't trust uh, mm. Anna with a fountain pen. Um, so, if we want to move <coughs> move away from the princesses and check out some villains here, um, if you want a general Disney vibes, like you're talking to like just the castle, I thought about my childhood and putting in a VHS and seeing that, <laughs> and then the little star going across the ca mm -hmm. the castle. I thought about the sailor pro gear in blue quasar. Mm -hmm. You've got two shades of blue, some sparkles. To me, that just feels like Disney. Mm -hmm. So that was my pick for general general Disney vibes. And if you wanted to go villain specific, um, both Maleficent and Ursula have the black and purple vibe thing happening. And the Diplomat Elox with purple rings, I think is a pretty sharp ringer for either of those two horrible ladies. Um, both, uh, I think, have it has the right tones. I think Maleficent a little bit more because the lines on the pen kind of remind me of like kind of the chest neck area of the dragon that she turns into with lines across there. Those are black lines and the purple lines, but they're all in purple. So anyway, it works. And then moving on to Hades, this one's easy because we have a gray pen with a blue cap. That is a pilot Kakuno and he is literally a giant gray thing with a blue head. So, um, well, hair, fire anyway. So that's a pretty good one for there. Uh, the Banu Talisman in Dream Bean is a brown and black pen, and Scar from Lion King is brown and black. So I thought that was a good match for him. We're just going visually, by the way, not really personality-driven for this list. I know I've done some before that like were a little bit deeper. Not going deep on this one. And then finally, we, I picked a black and red pen, which is the Tachiya Miyabi Earth Bokashi Lava, mm -hmm. uh, because we've got two pretty notable <clears throat> villains in the Queen of Hearts and Jafar that rock the whole black and red motif. So... Mm -hmm. We've got a twofer for Jafar and Queen of Hearts, and we've got a twofer for Maleficent and Ursula there. So that was what I came up with. Nothing super deep there, but uh, the biggest revelation so was fun. just uh, the princesses and how I just, I totally could see them vibing with the fountain pen community. Definitely. So, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to claim them as one of us. I think that's fair. One of us. <laughs> that's awesome. There we go. I have nothing to contribute or add to that. I thought you did a great job covering that. I could go further because there's just so many characters, but for the yes. sake of time, we'll fair enough. We'll hold back. All right, good stuff. All right, got All one right. more question? Yeah, we do, from Jennifer. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer's going to close us out today with a unique question that I've been sitting on for a while um, mm. because you mentioned something uh, that prompted her. I did. Uh, Jennifer says, can we hear about the story of Brian and Apple Cinnamon Cheerios? Yes. And I did ask you, I'm like, would you feel comfortable sharing this? Um, sure. And you said, yeah. So uh, why not? we went ahead and added this on there because we've alluded a few times about how Brian doesn't really ever back down from a challenge. Um, and he also likes to challenge himself. Yes. Uh, and this is one of the one of my favorite examples of that happening. Yes. Um, so a little bit of a disclaimer here. If you don't like hearing about various bodily functions, uh, maybe skip ahead, skip out on this one. Not to spoiler alert the whole thing, but I'll try not to make it too graphic, but you can see where this is heading. Um, so I was, I don't remember exactly how old I was. I want to say I was like in middle the, school, right? No, I was younger than that. I think it was like late elementary school. So probably like nine, eight or nine. Oh, um, oh relatively young. I'm thi <laughs> You're thinking of the other good story. I got a few stories about I forgot there was two of them. eating. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, we'll stick to this this one today. Okay. <laughs> so I was at home and uh, I, as a kid, I loved cereal. 
I would eat cereal every single day, not just for breakfast, but as like my afternoon <coughs> snack as well. Um, so this was my, came home from school, was gonna have my afternoon snack of a couple of bowls of cereal, um, cause I would do that. A couple of bowls? A couple of bowls of cereal, yeah. Sometimes I would have like three bowls of cereal as a snack. As a snack. Yeah. Shockingly, I was overweight in middle school, but um, I had no idea why. So anyway, I just really love cereal. I had a good <laughs> appetite for it. So, um, you know, we, I was never like destitute, but you know, my parents, we had to, you know, not, not flush with all kinds of things. You've mentioned that you had the bag cereal, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was much more common for me to get like the bag kind of generic version of yeah. cereal. It was like a special treat to get the name brand stuff. Um, so, you know, um, was kind of used to that. You know, I had just opened up a, a fresh bag of the apple cinnamon Cheerio Toastios or whatever the heck they're right. called. You know, which honestly they're fine. Like I'm not super picky about cereal, only certain ones. Um, so, you know, I got this big, I forget how big the bag was. I don't know, like 40 ounces or whatever the heck those okay. huge bags See, are. I've heard the story before and I've always pictured a box of cereal. No, it was a big bag. Yeah. This changes yeah. things. It was a very sizable amount of cereal. Anyway, <laughs> so I go and I just pour my regular bowl of cereal and I, I just cut the bag open, all that kind of stuff. And the thing is like, I mean, even now to this day, I don't even like to just have one type of cereal. I will mix like two or three different cereals together in a bowl and that will be my cereal. I like I like a bunch of things happening. Same thing with ice cream. I like different ice creams. I love junk in my ice cream. Also like your random food bowls too. Food bowls. Like you've put I like, like a diversity of foods. I've yeah. seen you put like a rolled up piece of lunch meat on top of a deconstructed, you know, stuffed pepper casserole. Yeah. 100%. And like and then like some yeah. sort of random carb on top of that. I like randomness and <laughs> randomness of textures, flavors, all kinds of stuff. Wow. This is how I roll. So um, yeah, so I've always liked cereals that have lots of different textures and things going on. Anyway, um, so I guess doing that as a kid, I would often like open up every type of cereal, which, you know, as a parent now, you're like, this drives you insane. Yeah, don't you dare. Because it's like, it, it like the freshness starts going down immediately as soon as you open that thing up. Not that it hung around that long anyway, because yeah. I obviously had a ton of cereal, um, but it would definitely happen. So my mom was much more of like the, let's finish up, you know, the ones that are left and then move Standard on to the next Standard parent one. philosophy. Sure, sure. So I cracked open this fresh new bag of apple cinnamon Cheerio equivalent and, uh, my mom mentions to me, she says, hey, I bought a box of Honey Nut Cheerios. And I was like, oh, I was like a special Name thing. brand. Name brand in the box. And like the Honey Nut Cheerios, I was like, ooh, that, that's even better. So she says to me, when you're done with the Apple Cinnamon Cheerios, then you can open up the Honey Nut Cheerios. You see where this is going. I do. And now having my own kids, and knowing like with Joseph, how literal he is, <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, I was the same way as a kid. So what my little nine-year-old or whatever brain heard was, well, I want to eat these apple, or I want to eat these Honey Nut Cheerios. So I have to eat all of the apple cinnamon Cheerios now, then I'll have a bowl of Honey Nut Cheerios, what I really want. So I went, and got one of those like giant like silver mixing bowls like my mom would use for like baking. And this thing was at least 12 inches in diameter, probably eight inches deep. I poured the entire bag into this thing, proceeded to pour in probably a half gallon of milk <laughs> into this thing. And <laughs> were your parents there watching you do this? My mom was around, yeah, because she told me about the cereal thing. But Did she, you know, they to, were. She didn't try to stop you? Well, my parents were. My parents worked from home and they worked like crazy, crazy hours. So my mom had kind of mentioned it to me. And then, you know, I'm just whatever, doing afternoon kid, making noises, pouring <laughs> cereal. You know, she didn't really have any clue of exactly no. what I was doing. Okay. I don't remember her like being in the room with me. I remember her like mentioning it to me at some point and then i was just i remember being there in the kitchen oh man so that my little nine little nine-year-old brain was like i need to eat all of these apple cinnamon <laughs> cheerios right now and then eat another bowl of honey nut cheerios so i did i ate the entire bag of oh apple cinnamon cheerios god fully with the intention of then eating a bowl of honey just, nut cheerios. just that much just a half gallon of milk alone yeah is enough to it was too much yeah 
Which is exactly where this story is going. So I eat the entire thing. At no point during this process was I thinking, this is too much cereal. I was thinking, I can't wait to have my Honey Nut Cheerios. So I proceed to eat the entire bowl of the Apple Cinnamon Cheerios. And then once I finish it, I'm so like- So you can have more cereal. So I can have more cereal. And at that point, I'm like, I don't feel so great. <laughs> so I um, I was maybe like 20 feet away from the bathroom. And I could, I could see where things were headed. I knew that that cereal was not long for my digestive system. So I started making my way towards the bathroom. And I didn't make it. Were you? I made it. Was you, were you moving quickly or slowly? I don't remember how fast I was okay. moving. I think I was trying to move pretty quickly because I didn't have that far to go. And it was one of those, you know, when you're a kid and it's like you have to go to the bathroom and it's like all of a sudden you're like, I have to go to the bathroom now. Now yeah. It was kind of like that. Like at no point while I was. I still have my moments like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. It happens. But, you know, usually as an adult, when you start to feel kind of <sighs> nauseous, you're like, oh, I can see this coming. Let me. Let me stop doing the thing I'm yeah. doing right now that's causing me to feel nauseous and <sighs> then I maybe won't get sick. At no point was that occurring to my little brain and I I then proceeded to get sick in all of the Not Cheerios. in the bathroom. I don't remember, I don't think I made it. I don't remember making it to the, I think I might've made it to the bathroom but I don't think I made it to the toilet, I don't recall. Did you, how close did you get to finishing? I ate all the apple cinnamon Cheerios. Really? I remember, I remember eating it all. Oh my and god! Then, yeah, that's when I was like, "This is so." This was is a so when decision. you were actually saying, "Okay, now time to move on to my more cereal." That's when you decided, "Hang on." I think it, there was at some point there where my my physiology took over, <laughs> and despite my mental fortitude, uh, the body just had 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 hit its limit. Wow! And um, and I proceeded to expel yep. said apple cinnamon Cheerios. And to this day, I still have kind of a taste aversion to apple kind cinnamon of. Cheerios. Yeah, I, like, I, it's been so long, I haven't even tried them. Yeah, I wouldn't even in, in a while. But I definitely like for the rest of my childhood, I wanted yeah. nothing to do with apple cinnamon Cheerios. No, but I, I still mean, love Cheerios and still love Honey Nut Cheerios. I still, I was very happy once I, you know, recovered and was then able to have my Honey Nut Cheerios. But my mom was beside herself. I'm sure she was not overjoyed with having to clean up my consequences but um i think it was just one of those amusing things that i did as a kid where they're just like it was like just the family story for a while of like yep this is this is what brian does so wasn't my only story like that no. that's why i'll save it i'll save others for another time I, I, i've heard this story many <laughs> times and it's still yeah. just I love yeah. it, and but I keep I keep that firmly in mind because I have my own kids now. So we are always disclaiming, you know, whenever we like, say something like and, and like this is just it, it's so familiar because you know while you are much more intelligent and you can understand consequences mm -hmm. as a result now you yeah. still do have that like that determination and that yes. drive yeah. like you have always had that like. I'm going to achieve mm -hmm. my goal. Like, yeah, like I, the, the, the mind is powerful. Like yeah. usually you can do more than you think you can. Yeah. Though at some point you will hit a limit. So, and I have found that limit many times in but my that, life. It's, it's interesting that like you didn't develop that drive. You developed the ability to restrain your own drive. Yeah. And that's that's usually interesting. Like I mean, that's that's yeah. I, I feel like with me, I I've, I've worked hard my whole life to develop drive, to like mm. cultivate, you know, uh uh, uh ambition and mm. determination and follow through. And that's mm. just been innate for you. Like yeah. you have just had to learn how to temper that and aim it yeah. in the right direction. Yeah, learn how to turn that into something productive. And, and that's that's and just, not that's fascinating to me. Yeah, just different different wiring, I yeah. guess. I don't know, but yeah. Yep, I have a, a number of stories like that from my childhood, but that was that was one for the ages here. So there you go. If you're ever wondering why you will never see me eating apple cinnamon Cheerios, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> but I've definitely told what was my the most, kids what was that the story. most recent cereal mixture you've had? Uh, yesterday I had some fresh blueberries, which is always a treat. Okay. Um, I had grape nuts. I had this other um, 
oh, what is the name of the cereal called? It's like one of those like granola, you know. Honey bunches of oats? Or? No, it like, comes in a bag. It's like a bougie granola. You buy it in like the granola section. Oh, it's not cereal? Section. It's cereal, but it's like granola. Oh, okay. Like, like earthy, you know, healthy gotcha, granola okay. type stuff. It was like a cashew and peanut butter with like chocolate chip kind of a thing. Okay. So that was in there. And then I also had Cheerios on top of that. So I wow. mixed three different cereals. And blueberries. And blueberries, yeah. I just like a cacophony yeah. of textures and flavors happening in my cereal. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, this is how I roll. So, yeah. Anyway, that's all the questions that we had this week. That wasn't even the, the what's happening. That was... No. Um, well, we're, well, thank you, Jennifer, more for yeah. allowing me the opportunity <laughs> to relive that yes. memory. I always find Brian's storytelling to be yes. hilarious. Yes. Um, if you have any other questions, especially if you're an audio listener, you can email us at pencast at goulaypens.com. Otherwise, you can just leave a comment on YouTube and we will check it out. All right. Now it's time for a pen spotlight. And we're going to spotlight the Lamy Lux. Okay. What do we have here, Brian? We have a bunch of different pens here, clearly. Um, we got some. This is an all star, right? So we're all pretty familiar. With the Lamy All Star, I it would is, assume. But now I want a blue LX just because I'm seeing it. I mean, so the whole thing with the LX, right? It's basically a jazzed up All Star, mm -hmm. right? Like they're not really trying to hide that. Um, oh, you know what? I forgot the, the tube that it comes in. That's part of the experience. But we'll have to just show a picture of that or something. Um, so All Star, you know, aluminum pen. It's got the clear grip, steel nib. You know, you kind of get it, right? Standard silver steel nib. Steel nib. Yep, silver steel. I mean, it could be black depending on which which pen that you're looking at. Um, so the whole thing with the Lux, it's a little bit more expensive. Um, it's going to have nicer trim to it. So, you know, some kind of finish, tr you know, trim that will more match the pen. So this is the, uh, what's it called? Maron. 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 Yeah. So it's like a, you know, kind of a toffee brown kind of a color. The best one. It has this nice, like, shiny brown clip and finial. You know, all of the finials on the regular All-Stars are just that black kind of matte plastic. Um, so these are little upgraded finials, upgraded clips, and then, you know, the same smoky grip section. But the nib itself is going to be, it's still a steel nib, essentially similar, but aesthetically, it just looks a little snazzier. Very. You know, they're, so all, they're all this black nib with the gold mm -hmm. trim around the uh, slit. Yeah. Looks really nice. Writes well. Um, so, oh, and then on the back end too, it's yeah. got the, the different color to match there. Whereas on the regular version, it's just black plastic, right? So a little nicer hardware. It just looks a little, just looks a little classier. Definitely. Um, and they're all sort of like precious metal themed. So that's why I don't know if we'll see a blue one because. Yeah, they're um, keeping them all in, in yeah. that family. So I've got, we actually have four available now. The gold one here came out originally, but it is no longer available i don't even remember that one yeah this is why i keep everything so i oh can pull boy. it back out so gold one you know it's like a matte gold still same black you know nib and everything gold on the finial Ooh. looks nice and nice and snazzy right yeah um but don't don't want that because you can't get it get out of here um so the ones that we do still have that they're still making the maron the rose gold which looks really nice actually um again same nib and all that nice rose gold accents there. So that looks pretty classy. It does. And then we have palladium, which is like a silvery white kind of a color. And this looks almost like the regular color, but I do believe it's actually plated in palladium. Oh, interesting. So it, it looks kind of a silvery color, but then obviously on the top, you can see it looks way different. And it's just a lot shinier too. Yeah. Um, so that is a little bit different. Um, and then last but not least, we have ruthenium, which is like a gunmetal type mm -hmm. of a color, um, which also looks really nice on the uh, top there. Is that too. one your favorite? Oh, it's hard to say which one's my favorite, honestly. I really like like the combination of rose gold and black. So I like this one a lot. The Marin is actually really nice. Yeah, that one's definitely my um, favorite. I like that one a lot too. So I don't know. I kind of dig them all. Um, honestly, I wasn't as crazy about the gold, but now that it's like not around anymore, I, I kind of like that one. Yeah. And now it's like a little more special, but you know, there you go. So these ones, oh, I should have looked up the price. They are a little more than an all-star, 
the regular All Star is what like just under forty dollars, and the Lux um, it comes in a little more elaborate packaging. It's got like this aluminum tube packaging, which is part of the experience. I probably should have grabbed it. Um, we'll throw a picture up here. Um, you know, for most people, the tube probably doesn't matter because you won't really use it. But that is an important part of their like packaging, um, and I think that's that's also part of the increased costs. Um, I want to say this is pushing more like. 60 70 dollars let me see if i can get the price real quick but you get the idea um yeah so that's it so there's four colors you can get um a same nib offerings oh 56 dollars. okay so it's really not that bad it's like 15 bucks more so it is a little more than an all-star but i don't know if you like the color selection they're different they look a little classier so i think they're worth a look if you're into the lamy stuff you know you can get um, nib offerings on most of these extra fine, fine, and medium. So kind of the same offering as the standard ones. The only thing is they, the spare nibs that you get for these are not going to be this exact design. It's not going to be, you know, you can get a black nib, but it's the plain black nib. So it's really just extra fine and fine and medium that are going to have that like black with a little bit of fanciness on the trim. That's about, well, all. There you go. That's about all I have to say about the, the Lux. All right. Do we want to talk about what's happening? Yeah. Or what has happened? What has been happening? Let's do it. All right. In my life, Brian, I've made some uh, some big life changes. Oh. Yeah, some big life oh, changes. Really? Yes. Wow. Uh, I've talked to you about this before. Mm. Uh, my wife and I have had some 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 marital difficulties in um, oh. in arguing or let's say discussing mm -hmm. how much a stained glass Pizza Hut lamp mm. um, would be beneficial in our home. I think this is common at a certain point in yeah. your marriage. This is, yeah, is going to come to a head. Yeah, you know, you know we're, we're coming up on uh, 16 years here. And, uh, mm. you know, it's just, uh, you know, we knew we were going to hit a rough patch. So mm. mm -hmm. we're just going to try to weather it. So mm. I feel that the Pizza Hut stained glass lamp is iconic mm. of a bygone era yeah. full of joy and happiness yeah. and pizza. And yeah. red plastic cups and <clears throat> oh, yeah, book it programs. I would I would love to yeah. have a, a large stained glass Pizza Hut lamp hanging above our uh, dining room table. However, oh, I couldn't see why my, she would possibly be opposed to that. Neither can I. All. Neither can I. Um, every every wife wants a centerpiece of a most every every wife pizza franchise except for Shannon. Yeah, wow, um, so weird. So you know, uh, it's been a struggle, frankly. So okay. Uh, okay. recently, I discovered a smaller version hmm. of that in oh. the form of a desk lamp, a smaller oh. lamp, a Tiffany style, you know, clicky knob desk lamp. Oh, wow. I found one on eBay. I said, honey, it's slightly more affordable, which isn't much at all. <laughs> um, I can have it in my den where my decor ah, happens, okay. Okay. not in the public area. Okay. So out of sight, out of and, mind. Uh, and, yeah. and it was the one time she chose not to channel the mom from A Christmas Story and <laughs> said... It does very very much parallel that dynamic, yeah, doesn't it? It's a major award. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's right. And uh, <laughs> she, she acquiesced. And it is now currently in my possession. Wow. And my life is... Oh, my gosh. ...so much better than it once was. Is it like it this? Like won. this round one? Uh, yeah, but, but smaller. But yeah. Smaller? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I like so, that. Uh, that is... Probably the one I bought. Yeah. Okay. Um, don't look at the price. Um, it's on eBay. <clears throat> oh, it's gone. Oh, it's not there. No. It came up in the Google listing, but then... Because it's mine now. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, but yeah, that's it. Wow. Uh, there's only one. I'm sure they, they made more. I'm sure there's more, but... Uh, yeah, that, that that particular one now resides wow. in my. I don't have a table for it, so I need to oh. actually get a little side table to put it on. Okay. But okay. It's happening. It's glorious and amazing and wonderful and perfect, wow. and it, it has made my life complete. So, wow. uh, it's it, like real stained glass. Oh right? yeah, that's the cool thing about stained glass. Like it's not cheap, but it can't really be mass produced. Right. You know, it has to be, be hand done. So, um, yeah, it, it's a reproduction. It's not one they had in the uh, um, restaurant because those were the larger ones on the pendant. Oh, yeah. um, but it looks identical. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. Oh, very, there's very. like a whole Reddit thing going oh, on here. They're in the, beautiful. Our nostalgia. God, they're so beautiful. So that happened. My life is complete and wonderful now. And uh, yeah, it's never been better. Uh, on the flip side of things, we took the dogs to the groomer, which we normally never do all three dogs at the same time. Okay. And we rem reminded ourselves why. Uh, it was rainy on Saturday. Oh, that's fun. So great. Yes. Uh, took the dogs out in the rain. 
lifted them up into the back seat, made sure none of them jumped out, you know, drove them over again out of the back seat, rain, wrangling all three of them. They're just all mm. so, so excited, just jumping everywhere. And Archer gets so panicked. He thinks that one of them's going to just jump out of the car and just run off. <laughs> And it's happened before. Like when we went to oh, the gosh. dog park one time, Hank jumped right out and started running to the dog park, scared us to death. I leaped at him, oh, tore my up my knees to like tackle him. So now, of course, he's Archer's just petrified that this is going oh, to gosh. be an inevitability every time. So it's all a whole panicky thing. Anyway, we dropped the three of them off. Um, <clears throat> later, we were reminded again why we don't do all three of them at the same time because the cost was just painful. Mm. But to be fair, they haven't had to go to the vet recently so that's fine mm. um and uh so that was okay and then that night um i went over to my brother's house and we watched ufc 299 and whoa that was uh, a very good event a lot yeah. of, you know solid event you know the guy i wanted to win the most um won he was 35 a gentleman by the name of dustin poirier who was wow. 35 is pretty old for a you know yeah. mma fighter yeah. um and uh, he 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 snuck one out, and that just that, that mm. delights me. Um, he's a good dude. He's got like his own charity and stuff like that. Oh, so that's cool. It's it's I can count on like one hand how many MMA fighters I like actually like as human beings. Yeah. So they're like just they kind of de facto become my favorite fighters because I don't mm. think they're horrible people. Yeah. So yeah, it's few and far between, but whatever. Mm. Uh, I brought um, Chad a new uh, vinyl album because he collects you know vinyl records. Okay. And he loves the movie That Thing You Do with. Tom really? Hanks, oh, loves it. And so... It's pretty solid. Oh, it's great. And it's got a great soundtrack, too. Oh, yeah, of course. Amazing yeah. soundtrack. So he was just thrilled when I <laughs> delivered that to him. Wow. Um, so he put it on immediately, put it on, started playing That Thing You Do, which is an amazing song, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, solid, solid movie. So that was delightful. I, it was nice seeing a solid reaction. You don't need vinyl records, do you? <laughs> Seems like the kind of thing you could get into. I'm not a big music guy. That's true. Just in general. Yeah, like, you're really worried about music. You're music like, just doesn't really occupy an important place in my life. That's interesting. I love I love certain bands. You love the bands you love. Yeah. But, yeah. Just, but, like, I don't, okay. like, say, oh, you know what I should do? Put on some music. Mm. I just don't do that. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. It's always just kind of noise for me. and It makes me hard. It's, like, it just makes it difficult to concentrate. Mm. Um, Maybe that's because of the type of music you listen to. And, uh, <laughs> no, any music. Like, I can, really? the only Maybe? music I can listen to and still remain a little focused mm. are just, like, instrumentals. Yeah. Um, yeah. But even then, I start thinking about, like, the instrumentals I would listen to would be, like, video game soundtracks or movie soundtracks. Mm. And then I just start thinking about the movie, and then right. that derails me fair there. Enough, fair enough. Um, but uh, yeah, and then uh, Sunday, I took Archer to a uh, friend, a classmate's uh, science museum birthday party. Oh, fun. So dropped him off there. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they're, they, they're remodeling that whole area over there by the science museum. They put in a parking deck. Yes. I think I've seen that. Yeah, I hadn't seen it before. So I've yeah. Been, when did I last go to the science museum? I feel like it was last summer. We took the kids there a couple oh, times. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, so I've been. But there's a bunch of stuff still under construction. Yeah, the whole front area is still all yeah. gated off. But yeah, there's a parking deck now. Wow. Um, so yeah, dropped him off there. Um, he had a great time. He just had enough time to go home, eat some chili, um, play a little bit of video games, and then go mm. back and grab him. And then we went to um, a friend's house um, for dinner. Um, and then, you know, we had about a dozen the people there and we just kind of had uh we brought mac and oh sorry we brought mashed potatoes and we just kind of ate and uh had the oscars on just kind of in the background oh yeah that happened look, look at all the dresses and stuff and like mm -hmm. oh wow that those sleeves are really poofy but that was pretty much <laughs> pretty much it and none of none of us really knew what movies they were talking about we're like what's yeah, that i feel like every year when i watch it i'm like it just makes me realize how much i haven't been paying attention we're to like oh that's the thing things. with that thing and the guy he does that thing but none of us had seen them so like yeah. none of us saw poor things none of us saw the holdovers never heard of those um yeah you know they're oscar movies oppenheimer one oppenheimer kicked some butt yeah so that i i did see yeah um, so that one i, I was able them. to say like okay yep you he, saw that in imax didn't you uh yeah yeah so that's like a you know yeah it's like a thing that it's you can thing. say that you've seen yeah i mean yeah <laughs> it, was, it was fine i don't want to watch it again but it was fine yeah um and then uh i worked with archer on a uh school project he has colonial day uh Ooh. on thursday so everybody um has to present a like a colonial occupation um like blacksmith or whatever he is a wheelwright so he needs to make 
wheels uh-huh. and uh, like kind of have a little station where he sells his wheels for his carriages. And yeah. everybody's learning about different occupations. So they can mm-hmm. t- talk to the other classmates about like what their job was, how things these things were made. Cool. Um, so we needed to construct some wheels for him. So hmm. using cardboard and toothpicks and a little bit of hot glue, once I told him he wasn't going to burn himself with it, if he was careful, <laughs> we got it going, came up with a... Sp- semi-solid design okay. of uh, some wheels. So we nice. got four done. We need to do two more before Thursday. But um, yeah, ideating that was a little kind of confusing because he wanted to just use popsicle sticks, but then they wouldn't be actual round. They would be kind of, you know, octagonal. So uh, went with uh, kind of bent cardboard and it worked out. So got that done. And then finally, I just uh, wanted to mention that I have renewed or reactivated my audible.com subscription to have access to oh. you know my old audiobooks and well mm. I already had access but like to the subscription is now active so I'll have one, yeah, you get one book get a month more, yeah. yeah because I decided to um, listen to my favorite book series The Dark Tower by Stephen King okay uh, I've read the whole series twice uh-huh. just with you know regular books but I've never listened to it. Yeah, so um it's a different I, experience yeah 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 i went ahead and downloaded the first book the gunslinger cool. and who, who narrates that uh the same guy that does like so he's like one of the, i don't recall his name i'd know it if i heard it but mm. he is like one of the most popular best like he, he sounds he sounds like an old fiction sounds like an old yeah. dude yeah he yeah. he did um i i know he did american gods by neil gaiman because i listened to that one as mm. well and he probably did stardust mm. no i think gaiman did stardust anyway um, I definitely heard him before on some other books, but yeah, he's he's good. He's solid. Nice. So um, started that, and I love it. Dark Tower is so weird. Like I've never been hooked on a book series as much as that one because it's so bizarre, like so bizarre. Yeah. What's the what's the plot of like? Well, it's the, kind the of 10 like second tour here. Uh, if you combined Arthurian legend, okay, Jedi's, and Post-apocalyptic Wild West. Wow, it's a lot of also a lot of genres, sci-fi yeah. fantasy. Okay, yeah, it's a it, lot. It's oh, a lot it, it is. Yeah, it, it absolutely is, and it's and it's you've got parallel universes. You've got a multitude of Stephen King's other works mm. mixed in. Yeah, like it is bizarre, and <laughs> I love it so much. Wow. Um, and you just and I've like I have a terrible memory so every time i re, uh, read it reread it it's kind of like picking up on new things so mm-hmm. yeah that's been fun awesome also like that that's the thing it's like if, if i'm in the car and i could be listening to music i'd usually just be doing a podcast or an audiobook i'd be listening to yeah. more musics musics if yeah podcasts and audiobooks weren't a thing for sure didn't exist yeah. yeah fair enough yep but How that's about? pretty much what's been going on for me cool yeah i'll kind of bounce back and forth i do plenty of podcasts what i do a lot i do some podcasts but I have a YouTube premium thing, so I can listen to YouTube videos like in the background. Mm. So there's a lot of videos about like, especially if it's about like science or history or whatever. A lot of times it's like kind of stock B-roll footage in the YouTube video anyway. So it's like, yeah. I don't really need to see what's going on. Yeah. So I'll like put that on. It's basically like listening to a podcast. So yeah, I do a lot of that. I've, I've done that t- for time to time, but I don't have premium. So I just play it on my phone. Oh, I just yeah. I used, listen to yeah. it in the car. Fair enough. But I, I use I I actually my choices are way more educational than yours are. I will listen to like you know top ten wrestling moves that hurt the worst, <laughs> or things like that. You know, nice. Not not to demean your choices. You oh, know? I have plenty of yeah. That's you know, true. but but yeah. distinguished gentlemen like myself. I mean, know, I we, definitely. I I look like there's like seven different people watching my YouTube feed because if you go into my history, like right now <clears> I'm listening <throat> to a sixty minutes uh, roundup of different things about artificial intelligence. Oh, um, so that's my current thing. I had, you know, Claude three chat GPT type stuff. Um, and then I've got some like tool hacks. Um, let's see here. What else? A little bit of John Stewart in there. So some politicking type stuff. Um, various cut ups of like Veep and Curb Your Enthusiasm, a little bit of rest of development some music stuff. Yeah, I'm all over the place. A lot of John Oliver. Been on a John Oliver kick recently. This is just all wrestling videos. I don't well, know you just had a, you me. just watched a UFC thing, so you're going to be on a on a tear. That's not the same thing. That's That's, that's Oh, you're talking like wrestling. R- pro wrestling. Pro wrestling. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, fair enough. And I don't even, that's the thing. It's like I don't even watch like like I don't watch the weekly wrestling shows. I just Yeah. I just watch like recaps. Of yeah, things. I'm yeah. just fascinated by the the culture and the yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. The That's industry. Fun. Yeah, I get it. It's a whole, it's its own world. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for me, I guess I've got like two weeks, mm-hmm. of, two weeks of stuff to catch up on. Mm-hmm. Um, well, first off, I think we, we were able to insert some stuff into the last, um, pe- the last pen cast, like barely. That week was crazy with the Lamy stuff, the last one that I was in. Yeah. That week was totally insane. Um, I'm not sh- I genuinely don't remember how much I got into all that, but I, I had sick kids. I was trying to finish up development reviews, you know, for all my direct reports. Um, we had several people who were like sick and out and, you know, various health things. So we were all covering for a bunch of different people. We had a manufacturer of ours visiting us here from out of the country. Uh, we had all the stuff going on with the Lamy dark lilac stuff. Had a reporter that reached out to me about the dark lilac stuff. We were we also prepping of, for some absences the following week and trying yep. to get a lot done yes. before that. I was trying to prep for my own absence being yep. gone. So I was like trying to wrap all this stuff up. All the Lamy stuff is hitting. It's getting kind of crazy. Um, so that was total madness. So I was able to get all that stuff done basically so that I could be like free and clear for going on this trip. Um, so this trip basically was a, it was like an e-commerce founder, like people who own e-commerce businesses to be able to connect with each other and just talk about all kinds of stuff that happens in their e-commerce worlds. So, um, I've been to this, this conference many times before. It's always wonderful to hear about all the random stuff that people get Makes up you not to. feel so alone, right? Absolutely. Cause I talk about fountain pens and it's just like, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. You know? Other people and are then selling. And you probably provide that for other people too. For like sure. someone talks about, like, hey, I sell, you know, springs that attach to the bottoms of your shoes for, you know, yeah. high jumps. Exactly. And you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Sounds, sounds Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Yeah. In the past, I've met people who specialize in uh, clown makeup. Like, someone's got to do it. High performance clown makeup. Um, I always have like one one new person, like one new company that I yes, made that I'm do. just like, yep, that's, that's, a, that's an out there one. I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, this go around, it was uh, organic chicken feed. So I was like, can't you like buy chicken feed like almost anywhere? And he was like, this is very specific chicken feed for like, you know, people who are, you know, raising, you know, like eight to 10 chickens. Maybe they want to have eggs for their family kind of a thing. They want like organic chickens to have purely organic, truly free range type eggs, stuff like that. And they've got to have like the best organic feed that they can get. So Basically, bougie chicken feed wow. is what this guy is selling. And I was like, there's a there's a market for everything, I yeah. tell you. So that was kind of cool. He was a super cool guy. Um, and it wasn't like, a, yeah, I'm selling things to these suckers. No, he like legitimately is like very high quality yeah. feed, all this kind of stuff. I believe in this. Well, yeah, so, you got to be passionate about 100%. what you do. Yep. Um, so that was kind of fun. Um, but before I went to the conference, I got out of some outdoor activities that I wanted to share because I didn't get a chance to share it because... It would have happened on last week's pencast, but right. I wasn't here. So, um, you know, of course, I'm like, partly I'd like finished up a whole bunch of stuff. And I was like, Whew. so I'm, I'm trying to like help around the house and stuff because I'm going to be gone. But I wasn't leaving until like midday on Tuesday. So on the weekend, I had a little bit of time. So I reached out to my neighbors and, um, you know, they're slightly older. Did I talk about this on the pencast? I can't remember if I did or not. Um, but I had some neighbors that had a bunch of trees cut down and they had all the stumps were left over. You did not. You told me about this. I think I told you about it. Yeah. And I, I, think I, talked about it on the pen I alluded to it on the last pencast oh, okay. because somebody was talking about, because Brian said, I don't actually have buckets of rocks though. That's one difference between me and okay. him. And then I said, spoiler alert, Brian got oh, some rocks. I got a rock bucket story. All right. So yes. you go this ahead. folds into that. <laughs> um, so yes, I had, you know, my neighbors, I'm trying to be like, Good Samaritan, good neighbor kind of a thing. You know, my neighbors are older. They have a bunch of stumps in their backyard that they're walking past all the time. I don't want them tripping over stumps and all that kind of stuff. So I have a tractor with a stump grinder attachment to it. So I offered to go and help grind up some stumps. Um, And, you know, that's what I did. I went and did it and it was awesome. I love grinding stumps. It was a lot of fun. I mean, it's it's so... It's so so gratifying. But but it's like, it's, it's like totally necessary chaos and destruction yeah, absolutely but and there's no other way to do it like no the proper way I've is tried. to just completely destroy mangle and maul it yeah that's actually the most effective way to do yeah, it yeah and so like that, that's mm-hmm. like what what else is there where and you don't really have to clean up either like 
No, not really. You just kind of leave it there and you, you know, just like kind of rake it out and it'll yeah. all break down and turn into. So it's like, what, what else can you just completely obliterate and just can be like, all right, there we go. Yeah. All pretty, done. It's pretty fun. Power washing, maybe. It's kind of like that. You yeah. Know, power yeah. washing, you just get the blasted away. And you're so. like, all right, everything that I just did is just going to soak into the ground or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's gratifying like that. So I, uh, yeah, I ground up. They had 17 stumps and Jeez. I ground up all of them in about. Do you know how much that would have cost? Probably a lot, but yeah, I was like, well, I got the stump grinder. Let's we'll wow. help them out. So that was pretty fun. So, um, you know, they kind of mentioned to me that like there was the one of the one of the stumps, like one of the last ones there. You know, the guy was like, you know, kind of messing around around the stump and digging and picking at all this stuff. And I was like, what is he doing? Is he like pulling weeds around the stump? Like it doesn't gonna matter. Kill those, bro. I'm gonna grind it up. So then I kind of get over to him, and he's like, yeah, he's like, I forgot there was a giant pile of rocks here like that i put here like 20 years ago when this tree was like a sapling and he's like i kind of forgot about it so it's basically like this giant pile of rocks that's like buried underneath the dirt that would hurt your grinder right yes that would be very bad for the for the grinder yeah because these are like chunks of granite like kind Uh, of thing like landscaping rocks i'm talking like not gravel like huge things yeah not not little bits of gravel which is would also not be good for but, but i'm talking like these rocks are like 30 pounds a piece probably oh. big old rocks so we go in there and we start digging them all out and i want to get that stump so I, we got that taken care of and then he mentions to me he's like yeah we moved these rocks here from our last house that we had it was so heavy and took forever he's like i haven't used them for anything he's like you want these rocks because i'm not using them for anything and i was like i like rocks <laughs> yeah i could probably find a use for these giant you know because like rocks like that like so I just, I've just recently bought some gravel. So the cheapest way you can get gravel is like the smallest, tiniest rocks. Cause that's like the stuff that's left over from when they cut the big rocks. So the bigger the rocks you buy, the more expensive they get. It makes sense. Right? So these like nicer, like landscape rocks, they can get pretty expensive. And he had a lot of them. Like it was deceiving. It was like, it seemed like kind of just a little pile and we were kind of digging around. It was a ton. And then he had like another pile kind of in the back of his property. He was like, I've had that pile of rocks. I stare at it all the time. I just want it. I'm, he's like, I, it's too much work to get rid of. If you want that, you can have those too. And I was like, I got a tractor with a big old bucket on it. Oh my gosh. I can fill my bucket with rocks. Oh my God. So I hauled probably 10 bucket loads of rocks. Now, now we're talking about like the, the long, narrow bucket, right? Not like yeah. the scoopy bucket. No, no, no. This is okay. a this is a five this... foot wide bucket Jeez. that can hold about a thousand pounds. Oh my god! I filled that thing at least ten times. Ten thousand pounds? Yeah. Of rocks? And maybe more. Yeah. That you felt like you needed? Yeah. <laughs> I took pictures of it because oh as god. there were, I couldn't, I couldn't tell. I'm not a like rock expert, but there were some that were clearly like some kind of granite. Like I could tell they were like harder, nicer rocks. Um, and then uh, there was some that were more like some kind of a slate or something like they were like breaking apart. But there you go. There's my my two piles of rocks that I kind of sorted out. Did you, you did, see did you, for, did you clean them for reference there? No, the oh. rain's going to clean them. That, I was about that's to say a that, glove. So you can get like yeah. a perspective on how big those rocks Good are. God. They're big rocks. They, they actually don't look. They, they don't look like they've been buried under the ground for a while. They actually look. Yeah, I mean, rocks will good. rocks will last a while. You know, <laughs> they're, they're you know, I mean, they don't look dirty. Yeah, like they're kind of they're kind of dirty, but you know they'll they'll rinse off, you know, with the rain. Yeah, but yeah, they're like I mean, literally, like I don't even know how many decades they've they had would, these what, rocks, what, what but you, like they're perfect. Oh, they're what just as good as the day they were. Yeah. What am I gonna do with them? I can do anything with them. Like you what? Never know though? what you can do with a pile of rocks. <laughs> like, give me an example. Um, you know, if I wanted to do like a a little fire pit, you know, I could make a little okay, fire pit yeah. of rocks. I could do, you know, if I had like a little retaining wall, or if I wanted to like. You know, on my on my driveway, I've got like a little, you know, a little pipe that goes under, a little culvert pipe that goes under mm-hmm. it. It's just like bare concrete, you know. If I wanted to like stack them up and make like a decorative pile of rocks. Okay. As like the so head, they're, the they're mostly wall. they're mostly decorative. Yeah, they're okay. just decorative kind of things, gotcha. you know. Or if I just need some like dead weight, you know, I just have a big heavy rocks. Like it's easy to like, I've got a ballast box on the back of the tractor. I can fill it with big rocks. You know, that's easier than like filling it with sand or something, well, yeah. you know, so like. And th- those things scoop okay? No. Okay, I didn't think it so. didn't scoop great. The, I had the, to basically put them all in the bucket by hand. Oh no! Yeah. So How I, are you alive? 
I don't know. I, Golly, see, those, the, I, look I do at that those, kind of stuff a lot. So. It's like like when you go to a candy store and you're like, oh, yeah, let me get some gummy worms. And you're like, oh, You're oh, like God. trying to scoop them? These, these are just, oh, That's oh. pretty much what it was like. I was <laughs> right? trying, I like kept trying to scoop and scoop and scoop and I could get like two rocks. Yeah, you get, you get the jelly beans that are just like delightful, but then you get like, yeah. you know, gummy frogs. You're like, oh, come on. This is, ah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's kind of mm. what this was like. Gummy sharks can't do, don't even bother no. scooping those things. No, you're just messing. You're just messing. <laughs> so yep. So I just moved a ton of rocks. Oh so my grinding God. stumps and moving buckets of rocks. And true to form, I'm sure Rachel just kind of was like, okay, when you said I needed, I just brought home ten thousand pounds of boulders. Yep. Great. She she enters into this state where it's just kind of like it's like it, it just like in, in one ear, kind of out the other, just like a wave of disinterest just washes over her. <laughs> and it's kind of like whatever I'm saying in that state is just kind of like suspended yeah. reality for her. Yeah. Like it's, it's, she, you know. The outside world where Brian a bit just where I will builds things and digs things. Yep. And chops down things and then build and then buries the things that he chops down. I'm basically like a toddler <laughs> out there just playing around in the dirt, moving rocks around and, you know, but I don't know. Got to help a neighbor. In multiple ways, because they didn't yeah, want the rocks anymore. That was anymore. super, super nice. Yeah, you, trying to be like nice, that, that, and I get that rewarded a... with piles of rocks. What more could you want? Yay! And I got exercise, too, and I got to enjoy the weather. Yeah. Got to spend time with my neighbor. You know, that is it was awesome. fun. No, that says, honestly, it does say yeah. a lot about you, like, going out of your way to do that. Like, I think yeah. a lot of the pe- a lot doing, of people would not. Trying to do the neighborly do, thing, you know? That's really cool. I don't think that I would have done that. <laughs> I would, I'd like to think that I would, yeah. but I don't know. Yeah, and I'm like, I live in a pretty rural area, so like, it would be very easy for you to just like never talk to them. Yeah, but you know, they're friendly. They've got a couple of dogs, a couple of little Pomeranian little yip yapper yep. things. Yep. Like every time we go to get our mail, these things are like, yeah. And it's like we've lived there for twelve years now. Those things used to be wolves. They used to be. That's right. I guess all dogs used to be wolves at some point. Yeah, they, were, they must have been wolves a long time ago. <laughs> right. Those little yipper things. They're, they probably weigh like 10 pounds. Oh, like, yeah, they're, they're like all fluff. Things. Yeah, they're, they're pretty cute, though. But they just like, they have no chill. It's like every time. A lot of little dogs are every just time, completely yeah. free of chill. Yeah, they're like, you can tell as we're like walking, like we're going to walk, yeah. you know, and you can see them at their front like picture window and the both dogs are just like, yeah, I'm going to get you. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, going to get you. It must be so loud inside You're looking at those walls here. Yeah. Anyway, so that was fun. So that was my... That was my fun little adventure leading up to my conference trip. Um, so yes, um, let's see here. So I did make a note. So I went on this conference thing. So that was like Tuesday. This was in New Orleans. So it was a couple of legs of plane-ness happening. Um, going down was fine. No delays. Plane rides were great. Coming back was a little bumpier. But <clears throat> I got down there. Basically, it was like three and a half days of listening to people talk about their businesses and then talking at and listening to other people talk about their businesses. So, you know, not too much to recap on that front, um, but I did get to do some other activities that were there. Oh, some other interesting companies. I mentioned the organic chicken feed guy. Um, Somebody else sells, um, I'll call it cheeky underwear. So like, you know, sort of higher end underwear, mainly geared towards men that have specific themes to them that lean into the underwearness if you can catch my drift. Okay. So getting to hear about how they market fun. Those types of things when maybe it's not appropriate in all how places exciting. to be marketing. Yeah, that must be um, a unique challenge. It is. Should we do a collaboration? Who, you know, <laughs> there would be a natural, you know, there's plenty of pen in your puns window. that you can be making. Yeah. Um so I'm gonna <laughs> Move right off that topic. Um, <laughs> somebody else that sells slime, you know, like the oh, kind yeah, of slime yeah, you mix yeah. together, that's but like really cool looking stuff. Now that's Some, easy to market. Oh, 100%. Uh, somebody else that sells money bags to like banks and casinos, like literally. <gasps> oh, those like heavy canvas ones with the all zippers. Types of bags. Oh, those they are like cool. 35,000 different oh. SKUs, like just every type of. A bag that you can those are awesome i've been yeah. like searching for coins on ebay before mm-hmm. and like some of them come in like bags i'm like i just want that bag yeah if you ever want to know anything about any type of bag i i know mr you know money, mr money bag mr money bag that's what yeah. he's called yeah um somebody else that um ships halal meat so like you know especially you know prepared meat for the, like, the muslim community and just learning what it's like to have to ship a perishable product and i'm like oh my gosh that is so much more complicated than shipping pens. Yeah. Um, Every time you've gone to one of these things that. and come back, you've both been educated about new things and then relieved that we don't have to do we a really lot of things. To, yes. Like like what, what, like um, you know, like accounts receivable and stuff like that. Or yeah. 
Accounts payable? Which, I don't know. Which one don't we have? We have plenty of accounts payable. Right. We don't have we don't accounts receivable. receivable. Because it's all, like yeah. you buy it on the website, you pay with your credit right. card, or it doesn't ship. Yeah. Other people, like, there's a lot of people that sell, like, big box stores. Like, they might distribute their products to, like, you know, Walmart or whatever. Well, they have to extend terms to Walmart. So they have to not only buy all the stuff, buy huge amounts of inventory, then they got to sell it in Walmart. And then Walmart waits months Ugh. to actually pay you for it so you're floating all that money in the meantime and it's, it's like horrifying you don't have any of that to deal with um uh what else somebody else that sells like fire blankets like fire safety gear yeah. and stuff like that i've seen ads for those crazy um a lot of people selling like jewelry dog treats dog toys that type of stuff the pet industries pet a lot of different pet industries cosmetics you know all kinds of stuff <clears throat> somebody else that specializes in like um uh hair coloring stuff for men, but it's like a safer organic, like kind of hair coloring for men. So like that, like really specific kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So just getting to talk to these people and like, how did they get into that stuff? And just all kinds of cool stories that people have. It's usually do you think like, do you think they could do a two hour podcast about their probably products? A lot of these people that'd be fascinating. They probably could. Yeah, yeah. There's, everybody there has got a really interesting story, which yeah. is why I love going to these types of things. Um, but it was in New Orleans, so when we weren't talking and you know doing all that kind of stuff. I did get to do a couple of fun things. Um, one of them is, uh, it's called a second line parade. So it's basically you, this is something kind of unique to New Orleans. You can hire a band of musicians and you get like the police to close down a street and you participate in your own little parade down like Canal Street and stuff so like that. So are there parades like hourly? All the time. There's parades all the time in the city. It's like part of their culture. Well, they'd have like, you know, they're probably most known for like their funerals. They have like the New Orleans yeah. funerals with the parades and music. And it's so like it's not just a weekend experience. thing. No. I mean, we did it at like, I don't know, it was like 4.30 on a So you had a, pers you had a personal parade? We had a personal parade for our little group and it was pretty dang fun. Like, you know, and it was like not, I mean, we started out in some side streets and then we went down Canal Street, which is like, it's like a six lane or four or six lane road or something oh, wow. with a trolley in the middle of it and all that kind of stuff. And the police shut it down and we're like marching down and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, wow, I feel bad for the people in the city, but I guess you kind of know what you sign up yeah. for if you do that. But it was pretty fun. So, so you just kind of, you neat. just walked and just waved. Walked. Yeah. Just walked and waved and, you know, everybody's got their like phones out and we're all, you know, doing the nice. thing. So that was pretty fun. That, that was pretty cool. fun. How often you get to be in your own parade. Fun fact, though, I actually marched in marching band on tenor sax and sousaphone. So you probably felt like you were missing something. Well, it like, where's my horn? I don't often think about like what it's like to march in a parade, but getting to do that again, I was like, oh my gosh, I was like flashing back so hard. Yeah, you, either, you, needed, player, you either needed a sousaphone or like a pretend rifle, right? <laughs> yeah, I've done plenty of that. Yeah. yeah. So like just remembering that, I'm like, oh my gosh, I did this so much in college. Yeah. Like, yeah, that was a whole thing. And I kind of like... Got to remember that I know how bit. to march. Get out yeah. of here. Let me show y'all how it's done. Marching Suzuki was pretty dang fun. Why didn't you bring say. a Goulet Pen's flag? You so know, you twirl that I didn't around. know. It was a surprise. Ugh. It was a surprise. They just told us to like show up at a certain time before our like dinner event. Oh my God. And then, like, oh, we, we're doing a parade. We show, yeah, Ad exactly. So that was part of the experience. It was like, what the heck is going on? Wow. And we're like all marching down and everybody's having a good time. Um, so that was fun. Um, also got to do a, um, a little, little, uh, like, outdoor activity, a little adventure activity, they like to call it. Wrestling gators? No, but one of the activities was kayaking and there were absolutely gators in the water. Like they saw like dozens of gators. Oh, <laughs> it was like a whole thing. A lot of I, people were kind of like freaking. I love kayaking. They're like warned ahead of time, but like for sure there were gators like up in the waters, like with the kayakers. Man. And I was like, I don't know that I'd have the guts for that. But Rachel would. She would want nothing to oh, do. Oh no, she wouldn't be upset if you did it. Oh yeah, probably. Oh yeah, she's okay. Like I, I don't do too much crazy stuff. Right, but yeah, I, I probably wish wouldn't have told her. Um, <laughs> but my activity that I got to do was blacksmithing. Oh, which is like, oh, come on. And that oh. event, that event filled up quick too. So I like got right on it as oh, soon as it yeah, opened up. Oh yeah, that's got I, your name on it. Like, yeah, and it was awesome. Oh, I'm sure that's like. Yeah right up your alley yeah it felt very familiar um i've done metalworking and welding and stuff like that but never like and you like hammers i love hammers i did i got to i got exposure to a whole new world of hammers so you don't have a blacksmithing hammer 
I don't, but mm. that might change because I really enjoyed it. I've I've gone down a YouTube rabbit hole before uh, with uh, like you know backyard crucibles and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. like you know aluminum smelting and stuff like that. Like it mm-hmm. looks, you don't need a whole lot. You can do it with kind of a minimal sort of setup. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mm. This setup was pretty. It was pretty basic. Like it was, ba- it was essentially it was done in like a garage. Like. <clears throat> definitely something pretty feasible to do and the whole thing was like it was a small forge so it was like maybe this big around Mm -hmm. so we were just heating up small pieces and the whole thing was propane powered so it was like a propane tank with this forge that was like this big and i asked the guy i was like how long does it take for this thing to heat up he was like five ten minutes oh wow and i was like okay so that's not crazy Mm -mm. so I haven't gone pricing out forges yet. He was like, yeah, you can even make your own forge. Yeah. Like, it's not a big deal. But he was like, honestly, they're so cheap. You can basically uh, That's buy another thing that... Well, like, that's the whole setup right there. Oh, so, yeah. Like, a tank and a little forge. Oh. You, know? you need, like, a bucket of water. And that's it. That's the whole thing. Wow. Very simple. I've seen even more basic versions than that. Yeah. But then uh, I got to make a bottle opener, and I got to take it home. So that was the thing that I made. So it, like, shows all the different steps. Of like, I started with just like a raw oh, wow. stock of metal. How'd you get the hole in there? You got to punch it. You got to heat it up. And then you have this big, like, it's almost like a pickaxe. And you like set it on there and you slam it with a hammer and you punch through the metal. Oh my gosh. I bet you had so much fun just like hammering bones. hot metal. It was the, like, it was awesome. Well, yeah. Well, like so the, primal. The, well, you know yeah, well, I mean? this also like, you know, kind of probably goes back to your woodworking route because oh yeah it's not like very similar not, kind of a vibe it's not like yeah. welding where you're just kind of like joining and attaching this is mm-hmm. creating something from nothing yeah like absolutely. you do with woodworking you have a yeah like there you go you so have a like, blank thing and yeah. you're creating a new shape from a completely yeah. blank oh wow it that's so like, cool yeah and you like put it in there and it gets red hot oh, and you gotta yeah. handle it with and the you, tongs and you gotta hold it in place and you like you used all the parts of the anvil and i'm like oh i'm like learning like why the anvil has these random yeah. holes in the brian, horn and brian, all brian k is super knowledgeable about that stuff 100%. too. 100%. Oh he, yeah, he, he, right just, up his he was telling me the other day about like the the point of uh um squ- squ- squelching, quenching, quenching. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um and I just thought it was like to cool it off. He's like no, no. No, no. That's totally different. It's to treat it. It's, yeah. Well, it depends if you're doing it in oil or if you're doing it in water. That's what he was saying. Yep. Yep, yep. oil quenching. That's a whole yep. different thing. So, um I got to bring home my little there it, Oh my god. My little bottle opener that I made. <gasps> so, it's is not the most beautiful thing in the world. Wait, did you did you does this have like an intentional texture on yeah. it? Yeah. So you did this like as a design? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. It almost so like, looks like, like diamond plate or something That's like what that. I was going for. Yeah, I did like a little crosshatch. Well, there you thing. go. So I used like, Look a, at that. like a hammer that had like a kind of a kind of a chisel-like edge to it. And and while it was kind of hot, I was just like slamming it in there and creating that texture. Have, did they have a bottle for you to use yeah. it on? Nice. Yeah. They gave us a bottle after we were done working all the tools. But I just had a ginger beer, which is not alcoholic. Nice. Um, and it was very refreshing. That's because it was, awesome. It was pretty hot in there. I'm not going to lie. But... Yeah, it's kind of cool. So it's like I got a trinket, and now I'm like, oh man, I like this is really not that hard to do. And so, you could get yourself a really cool kind of like leather apron to wear. Hundred percent. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I feel like I'd have to grow a beard. You know, yeah. it's just like that fits the vibe. Absolutely. But it was fun because I was talking to the guy. <coughs> you know, because it was like, you know, a guy probably our age or whatever that was doing it, and that's like his business. Like, because he was saying like, you know, he was he went to school for industrial design and. His wife ended up moving to New Orleans to, for a job opportunity, and he was like, "Yeah, there's not that many jobs in New Orleans for what I do." So he's like, "I just started doing the blacksmithing thing full time." So there's a lot of like wrought iron and you know stuff like that, like the railings and stuff like that, and like the French Quarter. So he does a lot oh, of yeah. that repair type work, and he teaches classes and does workshops and stuff like that. So I got to talk to the guy. He's originally from Pittsburgh. But I asked him, like, how'd you get into blacksmithing? He was like, well, when I was a kid, I went to Colonial Williamsburg and saw them forging, you know, wagon wheel type stuff and all that. And he's like, I just thought it was really cool. And then I learned how to do it. And I was like, hey, what's up, Williamsburg? He's like down the road from us. There we go. So there you go. You never know. You never know what, you're, what it could kick off in the future. So so what are the odds of you getting a little set up? Oh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Five out of 10. I'll look into it. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to say I didn't have like as much of a no pun intended, burning desire to uh, do it as I get it with welding because welding is like very practical and I really like that. But I definitely, like I have a press brake. I have a, you know, hydraulic press. I have some things that like I definitely need to bend metal. And I have definitely like had opportunities when welding to like heat things up with like a propane torch, like to get it red hot to bend it and that kind of stuff. So I've, I've definitely had purposes for doing that before, but I've never like had that little forge and I'm like. All right, here, here, here's what you could do. (laughs) Okay. You could make an axe 
from scratch. Oh, I could. Beginning to end. Yeah. You could do the wood handle. Mm-hmm. You could do yeah. the head. 100% Theoretically. Theoretically. your own axe. Yes. How cool would that be, Brian? That would Brian? be incredibly cool. Right? Yeah, that'd be really cool. I think you need to do it. The only problem is, so th- I have run into this problem with welding too. So I have a woodworking shop, which is like sawdust and wood floor, wood walls. Oh. Metal, like hot molten metal, uh, doesn't jive so well in that space. Mm. So I don't. It's got a wood floor. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, because that's like great for woodworking. Like it's oh. really good for your back. It stays warm. Like that is mm. ideal for woodworking. Uh-huh. And I also have like the dust collection stuff running through the floor. So mm. wood is like really good for that. But you really can't do any blacksmithing in a woodworking shop. You need like concrete floors, metal walls, that kind of a thing. So I don't quite have a space where that makes a whole lot of sense. I think you need a blacksmithing shed. I don't know. A shed would be a potential option to do it. So you see how this is quickly going to get out of control. You're talking, you're we'll talking to the wrong guy. I'm just going to keep on encouraging you. It's easy to say. It gets exciting. What I could see, so like with welding, the way I do it is, um, you know, I basically weld outside. <coughs> so that's how I can make it happen. So it's you can definitely forge things outside. Yeah. So I just got to weigh out like how much equipment would I have to haul in and out? How much would I actually do this kind of thing? So I don't know. We'll see. I might. And you could I'm also get it. it you could also get it done like just under a... Um, a covering, yeah. like you know, yeah, like a carport. Carport. Or something I like was that. gonna say that. I do have a carport. There you go. Oh, that's true. I never even thought about doing well, it. Well, at, uh, at that's what the uh, guy at Jamestown has. The Williamsburg guy mm-hmm. has a, a a room, you know, with a okay. stone floor. But the Jamestown guy, mm. he's just got a little covering. It's open okay. on all four sides. Yeah. Okay. Well, not one side. One side has like the brick chimney sort of deal, but yeah, yeah open yeah. on three sides. Yeah, but if I did a propane thing, that would yeah. be the way to do it. All yeah. right. All right. Well, we to be continued. Yeah, to be continued. We'll see. But I, I had a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> um, and then it was it was very um, interesting being in New Orleans because uh, I'm trying to observe Lent, which means I don't eat red meat on Fridays. I was definitely there on Friday, and I was like, all right, I'm not like super super strict about it. But I was like, I'm gonna try. Yeah. So guess where we had lunch on Friday as a group? S- steakhouse. Fogo de Chao. Which I've is, heard of that. We've had one of those around it's here. It's a don't Brazilian we? steakhouse. Oh, essentially a parade of oh, meat, constantly no. being brought to the table. And I was like, "All right, I'm being put to the test here. We'll see." But I was like, "I've had, I've had really nice steakhouses and stuff before. It's fine. I'll forego." Did you really? So I was eating like butternut squash soup. Did you and, really? Yeah, I didn't have any. Oh my I didn't have any god! Meat. You love those places. Meat. I do. And it was good, but it was also lunch, and I was like, "I'm gonna." eat way too much oh, too okay. so yeah that made it a little easier okay but because i've been to one of those restaurants with you oh. like oh and i always feel sick afterwards because <laughs> again i'll eat too many about- cheerios <laughs> you're gonna have some phenomenal meat of course i'm gonna overeat well, that. it's all you gotta get your money's worth i know but this was like part of the it was like part of the, the yeah package or whatever so, so you, it was like yeah. sunk costs like i've already paid okay. you know, whatever so i was like all right that's fine i can go but um, what they did have there that I don't remember having at like Texas Day Brazil or something. Yeah. They had this like fried, I don't think it was fried. It was like a baked cheese, some kind of cheese. It was phenomenal. And they like drizzle it with honey. And I was like, dang, mm. I had like nine pieces of that cheese and a lot of soup and a lot of veggies. I ate a lot of roasted veggies. Nice. So I definitely didn't get my money's worth, but it's all good. And then <laughs> it was also funny because uh, I'd never been to Bourbon Street which is like the like party central of yeah. New Orleans. And everybody was going out, the whole event was over and it was like, all right. I was like, I, cause I've been in New Orleans before. I was like, I can't remember if I was in Bourbon Street. I think I did, but it was during the day. There's not that much going on. So this was at night, a Friday night going to Bourbon Street. And I was like, oh, I definitely have not been here before because I would have remembered this. Now it wasn't like Mardi Gras, like people on the balconies showing inappropriate stuff or whatever, but it's basically just lined with bars and gentlemen's clubs. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, okay. Memorable. Yeah, it was memorable. And I was like, I'm definitely like the oldest person on this whole street. Like it was all younger people. And I was like, where are your parents? (laughs) And I'm like, (laughs) I couldn't get up to my room. So I had my backpack. (laughs) Because like I had to finish dinner and all that kind of stuff. And then I was wearing like my cargo shorts and all this kind of stuff. And I was like super dad mode. Nice. You know, while I'm carrying my water bottle with the uh, representing <laughs> my, my, myself there. And I was like, yep, 
I definitely stick out on this street. Nice. But I stayed there for like an hour. I didn't go in anywhere. I was just in the street. You absorbed the environment. So loud. Like every place was blasting music. And I was like, I'm really feeling my age a little yeah, bit here. And I'm okay with that. I was not, I wasn't yeah. drinking. I wasn't doing any of that stuff. And I was like, yeah, I have no desire to be a part of this at yeah. all. But it was just like nice to like see it and be like, yep, that's that's not my scene. Yeah. But now I can say I've been to Bourbon Street. Yeah, I'll just go to Port Orleans at Disney. Yeah, exactly. If you know what it felt like, remember Pleasure Island back when that was a thing? They no. used to have like all these different like dance clubs or different themes. No, um, I went to the only dance club I've ever been to was actually at Universal. There was like oh, an area of that. Okay. And it was awful. Yeah. So loud. Yeah. It was like that, except. I got like, I get, no. Ugh, panic. So it, it reminded me of that. I've literally been to one club yeah. in my life with Rachel. We went with my sister once. We were already married at that point and we went in and it was so smoky. This is before they had all the smoking bands and stuff. And we were just like, this is gross. Yeah. Let's leave. And we left and we smelled like smoke like yeah. for the next 24 not hours. Not my jam either. Like, yeah, okay, I'm done. Yeah. Um, and then last but not least, I mentioned to you how I was thinking about getting the video game. Yes, the the, the trucking game. Mud Runners, Snow Runners, which is a follow-up game made by the same people. As luck would have it, I was, I was thinking about getting this anyway. On my first leg of the flight going down to New Orleans, there's a guy sitting next to me on the plane that had a Steam Deck and was playing <gasps> Snow Runners. No. So I got to see it in the wild. <laughs> And I got to talk to the guy about the game. Oh and I was god. just like, oh my god, is that Snow Runners? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's a middle-aged dude like me. You know, just, oh my god. So I was just like, how is that game? Tell he's me like, about it. I was like, how is the game? He's like, it's pretty much exactly what you would think that it is. And I was like, that's all that I want it to be. Nice. <laughs> so I bought it. Yes! I bought it. I haven't played Snow Runners yet because Mud Runners came out first. So do you just like, are you like delivering stuff? Or is it just, is it racing or... It's definitely not racing. Okay. You just have you know what you know what it's like? It's like what I get up to. But it's 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 real time. Like it drives. You're like So you is, know, is it construction a, equipment or is it like a, a truck? It's like it's it's kind of like logging equipment. Like oh. you have like you have to take this vehicle and it's almost out of gas. So you gotta go drive it to the fuel station, which is like in the middle of the woods, and then you have to go bring this trailer to the lumber mill. That's like your mission. That's amazing. <laughs> There's no music. There's it's just you're driving at real time, which is like through the mud. Is it like cartoony or like really realistic? No, it's it's a simulator. So, so it's very realistic. So it's sort of like you know, like the Microsoft Flight Simulator. Yeah. It's like that. Oh. So it's like like when I was a kid, I would be like, I would want to play Microsoft yeah. Flight Simulator. I'd be like, all right, I'm flying. And then I'd be like, now what do I do? Yeah. And you're just like, no, you just have to wait for like an hour until you get to your destination. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to like watch out for the weather and all this kind yep. of stuff. It's literally just like that. So you're like wow. driving through it and you're like, oh man, it's kind of muddy here. Let me put on my differential lock so that I can get better traction. Oh, there's a little bit of a hill. I'm kind of slipping. Let me winch onto that tree. It's it's literally like So that. do you have like a little dude that comes out and does the winch and you get back in? Like do you no, play it's, it's a little more. It's a little more. You play as the vehicle, not as like yeah, a yeah, person. Yeah. There is a dude okay. in the thing, but you're not like, a, it's not like, you know, a, a, a you know, first person game yeah, where you're yeah, like yeah. following a human. Gotcha. You're like in the truck. But like, you know, one of the things was like, there's a challenge I had to like drive this truck that had like a crane on the back of it. And it's like, you have to drive to these different houses that have a log in the yard and you got to pick up the log and put it onto the back. You have to go over your neighbors and grind some yeah. stumps. Yeah. <laughs> but it's so funny because as I was doing it, I was, I was you know, going, I'm like, oh man, <laughs> you know, <laughs> nice. find the field that has flowers in it. You know, it's, it's, that is amazing. It's pretty, it's pretty lame, you know. For, no, that's for beautiful. A video game, but it's, it's like, beautiful. It's just it's 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 me in a video game. That it, is I marvelous. feel like I'm working outside. That is so marvelous in a video game. I'm so glad yeah. that you found that. Yeah. So like one of the missions, I had to bring some logs to a lumber mill. That was my whole mission. Excellent. So I drove all the way across the whole map through the mud and everything. It took me like 15 minutes, and then I found out I needed a trailer to fit the logs. So I was like. Guess I'm going back to my garage to get my trailer. And then I go back there and then I have to fuel up because I used all my fuels and I brought some logs and it was like, well, that's half the logs you need. So I had to go all the way back and fuel up again and on the way. And I came back and I made it almost to the lumber mill. And then I was on this like rickety little crossing bridge type thing, like what I would build. And my back tire slipped off and I lost my logs on the creek and my vehicle was like on its side. And I was like, I literally don't even know what to do now. But it was like, you lost all your logs. And I was like, it takes like 15 minutes to drive back and forth. And I was like, 
dang it. So I just shut it off. And yeah. I was like, okay. Uh, like, I can't get frustrated because like, that's what the game is. Yeah. It's like, anyway. I should have known better. Yeah. Oh, man. But it's fun. It's very, it's very realistic. So. That's cool. I'm having a good time with it. But I'm it's, so glad. It's, Do you think you're going to need to buy a second Steam Deck now? No. Okay. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> I'll just play it after Joseph goes to bed. And gotcha. I'm not going to be like playing it all the time because it's, honestly, it's kind of frustrating because it's very realistic, which yeah. is, real life is frustrating. So yes. anyway, so that's what I've been up to. Magical. Yep. Thank you. There you go. And I'm glad you got that game. And it's also, it's an Xbox game that's adapted for the Steam Deck. Oh, okay. So part of my frustration is like, the instructions are saying which button to press. I'm like, that's not a button on the Steam Deck. Oh. So I'm like, I don't know which button I need to operate the crane. So oh. I'm sure it'll get a little easier once I like oh, actually super figure out what to press and all that. Oh. Yeah, That's kind of how the Steam Deck goes. It's mm. like a handheld computer basically. Right. So sort of like if you're using like an emulator or something like that. Right. You sometimes have to like adopt, you yeah. know, certain things for like specialized buttons. And there's a lot of specialized buttons in this game because you have like cranes to operate and mm. various things like that. So anyway. This is boring and we can stop talking about it. Um, that's what I'm up to. So uh, I think we'll pretty much wrap this thing up now because we've it. gotten to the end. So here we go. All right, I want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Uh, ask us some questions so we can keep it going. We'll, that, we don't have a break for a while, so we'll, we'll keep this no. show going for a bit. No. Nope. Um, mm. And then, yeah, check out gulaypens.com for fountain pen, ink, and paper needs. And like and subscribe to YouTube, Instagram, all that stuff. And I have a random fun fact about something that I learned in New Orleans, as mm. a matter of fact. It's kind of gross. So if you're sensitive to, you know, gross things related to burials, uh, just go ahead and sign off now. Can't be worse than the Cheerio story. It's a little worse. Oh. It's, it's a little grosser. It's a little more graphic. But I have to explain it because it's very fascinating. So this is like I learned some interesting culture related to New Orleans. So they have like the New Orleans funerals, that kind of thing. So um, I learned about um, perhaps, I don't know if this is, like just an adopted historical reference to a common colloquialism or whether it was the true origin of it. But have you ever heard the expression wouldn't touch something with a 10 foot pole? Of course. I never knew where that came from. And I or, heard perhaps where it might've come from or at least been adopted to. So um, in New Orleans, it is uh, the city is below sea level. So it's the water table is very high. Yep. Things are very wet all the time. Um, and so... They learned in the mid 1800s when they were like really um, establishing the city and stuff that uh, if they were to bury people underground because the water table gets really high, people often didn't stay underground. Yeah. And that created a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah some so, floaters. Some floaters. Yeah. So they have to treat burials differently in New Orleans um, because of that. And so, you know, that all fits into part of the culture and stuff like that. But um, basically the way that they end up um, burying people is they have to do it above ground. So they have these things called, called a columbarium. So it's, you know, essentially like how you have the like pyramids in Egypt. Like a mausoleum? It's like a, it's like a tomb, a mausoleum. Yeah. Um, but so it's above ground. Um, but, you know, it's uh, it's so humid. It's like a subtropical climate there. Um, so um, bodies will decompose more rapidly there. So essentially what they do is they'll have, you know, they might have like a mausoleum for one specific person, but oftentimes they would have it for a whole family. So you would essentially have this giant, like kind of concrete structure or whatever that's above ground. Um, and you would place, you know, you might cremate the body or you might just put the whole body in there. Um, and you would seal it up, leave it there for a year. And after a year, essentially most of the body would be decomposed and you just kind of be left with the bones. Well, they would leave it sealed up for a year plus one day. That's like a thing that they do. And then when they need to put somebody else in there, they have to push all the bones to the back and it kind of drops off to the back. So you would use, of course, the like the longest pole possible to do that. And I guess a lot of them were like, kind of like a 10 by 10 structure, like a 10 foot long. So the 10 foot pole thing became like the pole that you needed to like push the old, like decayed, like body parts mm -hmm. so that you could make room for the next person that needed to be buried in there. And apparently that's perhaps maybe some of where that uh, expression came from. Wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole because it's super gross. Nice. And uh, you don't want anything to do with that. So Ray stands um, from Ghostbusters says okay. 10 meter cattle prod. Okay. 
Never seen a Guess cattle that prod that too. long. But it seems excessively long for a cattle prod. Insanely it's like long. 100 feet. Yeah, you need to have like a wheel on that thing. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a little ridiculous. But well, honestly, I think I, I, I'm less bothered by that than I am this Cheerio story. I think that... Fair enough. That, you know, but, you know, to each their own. But yeah, yeah no, that ain't bad. But uh, yeah. I, I have heard the story of the floaters. I, I was aware of that. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's an Fascinating. Yeah, so okay. little, little things you, you learn. Did you get to go to any, uh, you know... Um, cemeteries or anything like that i didn't because I, I know they can look pretty cool i know that's what um, i've heard yeah i actually heard about that fact from somebody that did a cemetery because there's like you know in savannah and charleston mm -hmm. and new orleans they have some really fascinating a lot of iron work and stuff like that yeah, really beautiful cemeteries definitely yeah i think it has to do with like the climate and stuff yeah, like that and, really and the culture cool. and who settled there and stuff like that so <clears throat> yeah pretty fascinating cool so, and i also tried to I tried to find a music shop to see if I could get my hands on a berry sax. Oh. But I looked up a few different places and it didn't seem like, and they were also not that close to where I was staying. So I would have had to like get- How close are you to your practicing goal? How's that going? Uh, I have 73 hours left. Oh my gosh. So I've done 20, whatever that is, 27 hours so far. That's impressive. I'm getting there. You're gonna be halfway before you know I'm it. getting there. I mean, I'm on track for like mid June at this point. So that'll come up quick, I think. Yeah. yeah. But I'm, I'm on so, it. So at this point, you don't know where you're going to buy it from? I've got a few different places I'm looking. Cool. Yeah. But it's so crazy because there's like some that are like like way too affordable seeming that are like, you know, obviously like direct from China kind of a mm. thing. And I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. But I'm also like, I'm not going to, like I'm just playing it for myself. Doesn't matter. Yeah. I don't know. So I'm, I'm in that process sort of like when you're with pens and you're like, why is there such a price disparity? Does it matter? What matters to me? You know, so I'm in the process of learning all that. But, you know, we'll see. Very cool. Yeah, got a few things I'm keeping my eye on, but that's got That's some exciting. Time. Got some time to figure it out. So, yeah. anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this. Another long, nice long pencast for you. So, um, thanks for watching. It's good to be back. And, uh, you know, we'll see you around. Right on.